Hello everyone and welcome to the Mail Infertility Virtual Preceptorship at the Mail Portal in Front Stage to Improve ERT Success, chaired by Sandro Esteves and Matthew Coward. I'm Lorella Bertoglio, I'm a scientific journalist and I speak to you from Milan in Italy. And it's extraordinary how these new technologies allow us to connect uh, all over the world. Welcome again. Infertility is becoming a huge problem worldwide. In Europe lately, we have celebrated the European Fertility Week and we have discovered that 25 million men and women suffer of infertility problems. Some lifestyles are a problem, substances, smoke, overweight, increasing age, and lately also electronic cigarettes seem to be a danger for fertility. After this pandemic year, we have also discovered that, for example, that in Italy, birth rate has never been so low since 1961. But let's go back to our preceptorship, uh, preceptorship and uh, I will ask our chairman if the situation is the same um, worldwide. Uh, andrology is a branch of medicine concerned with male sexual and reproductive health uh, emerged as a speciality at the end of the 19th century. However, it was not until the later half of the past century that andrology had been recognized as one of the most intriguing subspecialties of human reproduction. The demand for andrologists and reproductive urology is increasing. However, there are insufficient experts to keep pace uh, with the requirements. The scope of modern andrology covers a broader spectrum from genetic studies to assisted reproduction techniques, and there is a clear need for updating healthcare professionals in these aspects. This preceptorship uh, is a unique opportunity to urologists, gynecologists, embryologists, andrologists, and scientists working in IRT to learn the tools to implement reproductive andrology in a fertility center. The participants will be guided by international experts through lectures, debates, and interactive discussion. Apart from proving new insights into male infertility, this educational activity will give a guided journey through a modern center specialized in male reproductive health. It is a pleasure for me to introduce you to the chairs of our live session, Professor Sandro Esteves and Professor Peter Umaiden. Sandro Esteves is a board certified urologist uh, in uh, consulting in assisted reproduction over 25 years of clinical experience in all area of, of uh, reproductive medicine with specialization in male reproduction. Uh, his work focuses on the interface between male factor infertility and assisted reproductive technology, the importance of semen analysis and sperm DNA fragmentation testing in the evaluation of men with infertility and tra treatment modalities, including varicocele repair and sperm retrieval techniques using microsurgery. Is listed by Expertscape among the top three world experts in the area of male infertility, azospermia, varicocele, and sperm retrieval techniques. Sandro is the founder uh, and medical director of the Androfert Andrology and Human Reproduction Clinic in Campinas, Brazil. He established the first Brazilian fertility clinic with the primary focus on male infertility. He is also a collaborating professor of urology at the University of Campina in Brazil and honorary professor in reproductive medicine at the Arraus University in Denmark. He currently serves as the head of the Department of Human Reproduction of the Brazilian Society of Urology at Sao Paulo Session. Sandro has authored and co-authored over 300 publications and 10 textbooks and sits in the, the editorial board of uh, several medical journals devoted to urology, andrology, and reproductive uh, medicine. What about Peter Umaiden? Peter is a specialist in uh, reproductive endocrinology, professor at the Fertility Clinic Sky Regional Hospital at the Arraus University, Denmark, and honorary professor at the Odense University. 
Yes. I cannot hear her. Lorel is muted. I'm sorry. Um, he's the founder of the International Society of the Copenhagen GNRHA Triggering Workshop Group and co-founder of the Poseidon Group, which has suggested a new stratification of the poor responder patient. Moreover, he's a past board member of the S uh, ESHRE Sick Endocrinology Group. He authored and co authored over 200 articles in international peer reviewed journals, as well as the Danish guidelines for OHSS prevention and chapter in textbooks. Professor Umaiden has a wide international scientific network and is frequently invited as a speaker in international conferences. To make it easier for all, we will continue this preceptorship in an informal way. And from now on, I will start with the formality. So, Sandra and Peter, welcome. Thank you very much, Lorella. It's a pleasure to be here. And, and thank you also very much, Lorella. And uh, it, it's it's a it's a huge pleasure for me to be here. And some of you might ask, what on earth what on earth am I doing here, talking from Denmark? Well, the fact is that Sandro is actually the honorary professor of my university, and we do a lot of collaboration together on male infertility. That's the reason why I'm today. Thank you, Peter. Sandro, you are so I would like to welcome everyone to this preceptorship. It's my big pleasure to be here with you today. And I would like to thank you all for taking out time to be with us today. Lately, you will uh, introduce us to the preceptorship, but I would like to start uh, with um, Peter. Peter, uh, should, we in, uh, should you introduce us uh, to the MEDEA? Yes, thank you very much, Lorella. So you could say, what is MEDEA and what is this educational academy? Well, as you can see, it's a global education provider, which is dedicating to develop, implement and evaluate medical education programs all over the world. And we try to offer support to healthcare professionals to, you know, continue the professional development. And uh, at the heart of uh, MEDEA is an independent and international pool of scientific experts. I'm one of those experts and also educational experts, academics and leading healthcare professionals. And all of them have a long established background in medical education. Now, these are just some of the uh, activities that, you, that we do in MEDEA. You can see we do training, we do development of data collection, we do journal-based activities, live and online activities like the one that you see here. We also do medical writing services and MEDEA also do, uh, does webinars like the one that you see here. So a broad package of different activities introduced by Medea. Here you see the board of experts. And I think we all know the majority of these people who are well-cited, well-published, uh, and who all of them actually do a lot of international, international lectures. So I think we can say that this is a very well-experienced experienced board of experts. Now, According to accreditation, well, you can see that MEDEA adheres to guidelines and standards of the EACCME. And for this specific meeting, an application has been submitted for the, the total three live sessions. Now, there are some very important uh, points here. If you want to get the certificate, the EACCME certificate, you need to fill in the survey at the end of the live session. And remember that the survey will only be available at the end of the session. And then having filled in the certificate, you will receive your, uh, your certificates and the diploma for particip participation of this event. Now, again, this is an interactive meeting. So obviously you will be able to submit, submit the questions during the live sessions. And there will also be at least three uh, polling sessions during uh, this large uh, webinar. 
Now, a very important thing is here that you need to press the icons. You can see that there is an icon for Q&A and there is an icon for, for polling. And to get into the program, you need to press the icon. I just stress, please remember to stress the icon because only this will allow you to pose the questions and to enter into the, the polling program. Again, this expert meeting will, uh, will be available playback on the uh, www.maleinfertility.education in the web. So I think I'll hand over the word to okay. Lorella again. Yeah, yeah, much. yeah. Thank you very much, Peter. You explained it very well. You did better than I could ever do. So now let's go on to Sandra. Sandra, will you introduce us to the preceptorship? Thank you very much, Peter, Lorella. I would like to share some words with you about this male infertility preceptorship. Um, this was a, a very interesting experience that we have had organizing it with a, a lot of work that we prepared with a, uh, for you. So the male infertility preceptorship is the first of its kind in the program that is completely free. Uh, all of you have already registered but the preceptorship started on May 3rd and it's going on until June the 30th. So it means that you can invite your colleagues, send to your uh, other people who might be interested to learn more about male infertility. So the only thing they need to do is the registration. So I developed the program with my colleague from the United States, Dr. Matthew Coward, who is professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, Matt uh, contribute a lot to this program. He will be handling a, uh, a live session as well in his clinic in June. So I hope you have the time to uh, also participate. So thank you very much, Matt, for uh, uh, your contribution to the program. So this program was made possible by an unrestricted grant and also the collaboration of the three host clinics, Andro Fert, which is hosting this live meeting today, from Campinas, Brazil, Hamburg Fertility Center in Hamburg, Germany, and also the UNC Fertility uh, Chapel Hill, uh, North Carolina in the United States. We have also partnered with the Brazilian Society of Urology, Sao Paulo section, and the Portuguese Society for, um, for Reproductive Medicine. So thank you very much for all of you contributing to the program. So as Lorela have already introduced it, this is an opportunity for urologists, gynecologists, embryologists, andrologists, scientists working in this field to learn more about reproductive andrology and how we can work together with uh, our colleagues, gynecologists, uh, helping and providing better care to our patients. So uh, we prepared a program in which we hope at the end of this uh, experience, you will acquire um, tools on how to standardize the male infertility evaluation, the importance of the male partner for I mean, for the whole thing, including assisted reproductive technology. So you learn about the, uh, the tools, the tests, and also the treatments that could be used to improve uh, the men's fertility. So we prepared a, a website. In the website, you have access to a library. You can submit your case study. You can see the agenda. You can uh, learn more about the faculty. You can ask questions. Uh, and uh, you can also actually uh, enroll in the, in the live sections. We have had a uh, tremendous uh, amount of interest that it was quite uh, rewarding for us with a, uh, more than 128 countries participating in this program. We have over 500 people registered for this meeting. So we are very happy with, uh, and I would like to, th to thank all of you from all over the world, from each country participating. A big thank you for being here with us today. So this slide shows the audience profile, which is very interesting that I see that uh, many participants, they are either uh, reproductive endocrinologists and they are 
gynecologist. So actually, again, stressing the importance of male infertility, raising interest for people, uh, for these doctors who are not actually urologists and andrologists. We have also interest for uh, from reproductive urologists and andrologists, as you can see, but it's quite broad, uh, let's say, uh, audience that we will have in this program. So you started with the registration, you uh, filled the, uh, this pre-survey, you can go for the library, watch some movies, and then have access to some articles for free. If the article that is listed there is not uh, readily available, the PDF, you just can send us a message asking us to send you the full text of that particular article. You have uh, also access to recorded video lectures that are available for you, case study submission, as I said before, and today we are in the first live meeting. At the end of the program, you will have a post-survey and then some follow-up. So basically the program uh, contains seven video lectures, three live sessions. We have the chat home, the diploma certificates, and the library. So there's a lot of things in the website uh, that we made available uh, to you, and I uh, hope you enjoy it. So this is how it looks like. You can choose the, the recorded talk, you join the session, and then you can on demand at the comfort of your office your home, uh, actually see this, um, these uh, lectures uh, when you are available. On the, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the three live sessions. The first one today hosted by Androfer. We will have the second one on, um, on the end of May in Hamburg, Germany. And then in June, the third one uh, at the University of North Carolina Fertility in the United States. So you can submit your case. If you haven't done uh, a case submission yet, you can submit for the next live session. So they will discuss, they will select some cases and discuss during, during the show. So now uh, it's my big pleasure to introduce uh, the faculty that will be working with us today. From our center, um, besides myself, we have Fabiana Nakano. Fabiana is a gynecologist, specialist in reproductive medicine. We have also Fabiola Bento. Fabiola is general and quality manager of our center. So uh, Fabiola and Fabiana will be available for uh, during, during the case discussion. We will have also Ricardo Miaoka. Ricardo is reproductive urologist working also with us. We have Arnold Ackerman. Arnold was a former fellow in our program and he is now part of our team. And we have also Dr. Rita Figueira. Rita is laboratory supervisor of Androfer. Rita has over 15 years experience. Uh, she's a PhD with a lot of experience in, in IVF. So I thank you all of them for being with us today. So this is the agenda, I will go very quickly. Uh, now we will have a virtual visit in the clinic. I mean, Androfer, you know more about Androfer. Then what we will have, we will have a summary of three video lectures that are included in the program. We will summarize uh, lesson one. This is gonna be done by my colleague, Ricardo. Male Infertility Workup, Standardization for Better Clinical Management. After this summary, we'll, we'll have Q&A session for about 15 minutes. Then it will be followed by the, another summary. This is lesson about medical treatment of male infertility. Again, Q&A, so you will be able to post your questions. And then it will be followed by another summary, lesson seven, which is non-obstructive azoospermia, after that, I will show you a short movie about microtizi, and then again, Q&A about lesson seven. So keep your questions specific for the, the lectures that have been summarized. So after concluding uh, this part, we will have an open clinical case discussion with participation of uh, one of our colleagues from India, Dr. Pramod, will be here with us 
presenting a case and also Dr. Uh, Ackerman is going to present another case, followed by the concluding remarks by, by Peter and myself. So with that, I would like to hand it over to Lorela again, and then let's get started. Thank you very Andrew, much. I have a curiosity. At the beginning, I mentioned the numbers that um, I discovered that uh, the infertility problems, 25 million. Uh, is it the same uh, for the rest of the world? We have attendees uh, today from uh, all over the world. Are the numbers the same? Is the situation the same? The global estimates indicate that we have over 180 million infertile couples uh, across the globe. Obviously, the situation varies in different regions and in different countries. But what we can say and discussing with our colleagues and Peter and myself, we travel a lot. We participate in many interactions with colleagues across the globe. And the male infertility issue is relevant everywhere. In some, uh, in some areas, even more relevant because, for instance, in certain countries, in certain regions, which uh, the doctor cannot resort on sperm donation. Uh, I mean, it's even more important that we treat the male partner with, uh, I mean, opportunity to have their own biological offspring. I think this is like, a, uh, this is, if we can say, uh, the male infertility is like uh, also very relevant across the globe, including, including different regions, different ethnicities, Lorela. Thank you, Sandro. And uh, thank you for your contribution, the, uh, the agenda that you presented. And uh, I will introduce you uh, now to Fabiola Benton and to her presentation to the virtual uh, visit of the clinic. Uh, about Fabiola, I can say that is the co-founder of the Androfert and Androfert Administrative and Quality Manager. She has a Master in Business Economics and Diploma in Quality Management by the British Standard Institute from the United Kingdom. Fabiola was responsible for the implementation and certification of Androfert's quality management system according to ISO 2000, uh, 9001. Fabiola will now introduce you to the Androfert uh, Andrology and Newman Reproduction Clinic. Fabiola, to you. Thank you, Lorela, for the introduction. Hello, everybody. I want to once again welcome everybody, all the participants, to, to our live session. It was uh, my job to introduce you, kind of introduce you to Androfert, something a little bit difficult considering the distance. So we came up with a video that we called a virtual visit that we're going to show our infrastructure and what we do. It's a brief, a short video and that I hope you enjoy. Uh, thank you very much, please, the video. Welcome to Androfert, Andrology and Human Reproduction Clinic. My name is Fabiola Bento, I'm the Quality Manager, and it's my pleasure to be your guide during this virtual visit. Androfert is a private clinic founded in 1996. It's located in the city of Campinas in Sao Paulo State, Brazil. Campinas is the core of a metropolis of 2.6 million people and is the third largest city in the state. It is served by a major international airport and major roads and is only 90 kilometers from the state's capital, Sao Paulo. Androfert is a standalone fertility center fully equipped to offer all kinds of fertility treatments. It's also the first ART center in South America to obtain a full ISO 9001 certification. Our facilities include a referral andrology lab and sperm bank, an operating theater for egg collection, hysteroscopies and male infertility surgeries, two IVF labs, as well as cryo rooms. All these areas are certified clean rooms with a centralized air quality control system. A full range of outpatient surgeries are performed in our operating theater including microsurgical procedures such as varicose repair, vasovasostomy, vasoepididymostomy, epididymal and testicular sperm retrieval. 
hysteroscopies, egg collections, and embryo transfers are also performed in our operating theater. Unrefert has two clean room IVF labs that can operate independently. Our labs carry out all kinds of assisted reproductive procedures, including IVF and ICSI, blastocyst culture, pre-implantation genetic biopsy, time-lapse imaging, as well as embryo and egg vitrification and sperm and testicular tissue cryopreservation. Our andrology lab offers basic and advanced semen analysis, including assessment of sperm DNA damage and sperm cryopreservation. Antrofert has many consultants associated with its ART program. The clinic's staff members total around 31 people. Besides providing fertility treatments, Androfert is also engaged in education. It has trained many national and international doctors and embryologists over the last years. Our clinic has been recognized by the Brazilian National Agency of Sanitary Surveillance as a model fertility center for the last 10 years, and it provides training for the agency's inspectors. Following our commitment with education, Androfert has partnered with Unicamp, State University of Campinas, one of the top five universities in South America. Our partnership is with the Department of Surgery Division of Urology. Senior residents of its urology program rotate in Androfert as part of their subspecialty training. We also have research collaborations with international centers in the United States, Denmark, and Spain. Together, we have achieved an outstanding scientific production and have become a referral center for male infertility. Thank you, Fabiola, uh, for your present for the presentation of the video. It was a fantastic video. Can't wait uh, to come and visit it uh, to in Campinas. Maybe next year. Who knows? Uh, if the pandemic finishes, uh, maybe we will be able to meet. Uh, and um, thank you, Fabiola. Do you want to say thank something? You. Yes. No. Just 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 leave the invitation for everybody to come when conditions allow. Right. So you yeah. can come in person and, and visit us and, and we can meet. Thank you. Okay, we will now move forward uh, with the summary of the video lecture L1 on male infertility workshop, a standardization for better clinical management presented by Dr. Ricardo Miaoca. Let me introduce you to Ricardo. He's a reproductive urologist who was trained under the supervision of Sandro Esteves. Uh, Ricardo was ranked number one urology resident in chief in Brazil and earned the Alberto Gentile Award for this achievement in 2009. Ricardo completed a research fellowship in minimally invasive surgery at the University of Minnesota uh, in the USA in 2009. He received a PhD in urology at the University of Campinas Unicamp in 2013, where he currently work, uh, works as an assistant uh, professor. Dr. Miaoka's main clinical interest includes the andrological um, evaluation, varicocell uh, microsurgical repair, and microsurgical sperm retrieval techniques uh, for assisted reproductive technology ART. Uh, he serves uh, as a reviewer for many journals in neurology and has authored and co-authored several papers and book chapters in male infertility and related areas. Ricardo, to you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I would like to, first of all, thank Dr. Stavis and the media program for this kind invitation. So it's going to be my pleasure to summarize to you guys lesson number one, Mayo Infertility Workup standardization for better clinical management. So I remind you that this full talk is available in the preceptorship website for those who had not seen it yet. 
So here's an outline of what was uh, covered in this talk, the male infertility definition with some facts and figures, the relevance of male infertility in the ART era, the male infertility causes, and the standardization of male infertility evaluation. First of all, I wanted to highlight the male infertility definition. So male infertility is a disease of the male reproductive system caused primarily by genetic and congenital conditions anatomical, endocrine, functional or immunological abnormalities, chronic illness, and sexual conditions incompatible with intercourse. These factors may be associated uh, with deficiencies in the semen, which are not always detected by routine semen analysis. So why this definition is important? It's important because it clarifies that the male infertility evaluation based on uh, the results of routine semen analysis is insufficient to determine if a patient has any underlying fertility factor, several of which can be treated or alleviated with a positive impact on the overall male reproductive health and also possibly on the results of the ART. Unfortunately, the male partner is often overlooked in the evaluation or, and treatment of infertility. Routine semen analysis is frequently the only test carried it out to assess a man's fertility potential. However, as reason by Dr. Steves in this comment he's written for The Lancet, a male infertility workup primarily based on routine semen analysis does not provide men with an optimal uh, fertility pathway, uh, mainly for three reasons. So first, Reference uh, intervals do not reliably distinguish fertile from subfertile individuals. Second, the results obtained from an individual patient have restricted uh, predictive value for both natural and assisted conception, unless they are at extreme lower limits. And third, routine semen analysis does not detect sperm DNA defects that may, might affect adversely the embryo development, implantation, and, off, and also the offspring health. So in fact, professional guidelines concur that both male and female partners should undergo simultaneous assessment for an infer, initial infertility evaluation, and that the male infertility, the, the male evaluation should not be limited to semen analysis. The male evaluation should also include a medical and reproductive history, a physical examination, and other investigations like hormonal assessment, sperm functional tests, genetic analysis, and imaging. So these additional tests may be required depending on the clinical characteristics and semen parameters. At the end of the day, the goals of a well-conducted male fertility workup are the identification of potentially correctable conditions, irreversible conditions suitable for ART using patient's own sperm, conditions in which donor insemination or adoption are the only options, health-threatening conditions or associated medical comorbidities requiring medical attention, and genetic abnormalities or lifestyle and age factors that may affect the patient's or offspring health, mainly if ART is used. So the male partner has to have a central role, just as important as the female partner, even when ART is programmed. The reason is men suffering from infertility have impaired overall health, a decreased life expectancy, and usually a lower quality of life. Also reduced fecundability, which sometimes is shown as longer time to pregnancy, and increased the risk of pregnancy loss. So the optimal outcomes in IUI and ART treatment and increase the risk of transferring a genetic defect that might affect the health of the resulting infants. So when it, what we need to do is to include the male partner in the initial infertility evaluation and provide these men with a standardized male infertility workup. Just as all infertile women are treated by doctors with a specialized gynecologic training and expertise, all infertile men should be evaluated by specialists in male reproduction. At Androford, both partners undergo simultaneous evaluation using a standardized approach. For our male patients, our protocol has been pub published, and it includes a thorough medical and reproductive history, 
a detailed physical examination, a two sample semen analysis according to WHO manual for the examination of human semen, and further investigation involving hormonal assessment, sperm functional tests, genetic analysis, and imaging, depending on the clinical characteristics and the semen analysis. I'll highlight the key features of our male infertility assessment. So first, the male infertility history, which can, vary, can be very informative. Uh, here's a checklist of what we need to cover during the history taking. Uh, infertility history, sexual history, childhood and development history, personal medical history and current health status, previous treatments, gonadotoxin exposure, and family history. A detailed physical examination is mandatory in the evaluation of the every infertile and fertile male, and it includes assessments of uh, secondary sexual characteristics, scroll examination, which should include estimation of testicular volume. In our uh, routine practice, we use the Prater's archidometer for estimating the testicular volume and a spermatic core examination, particularly searching for palpable varicocele. Palpable abnormalities of the testes should be evaluated with uh, imaging studies as infertile male uh, are at a higher risk of developing testicular cancer with an estimated hazard ratio ranging from three to 12 times. Our semen analyses are carried out in-house as we are fortunate to have a very uh, dedicated andrology laboratory. In most cases, our patients have two semen analyses done with us. Our semen analyses include the basic or routine assessment, and in whenever uh, appropriate, we include a test of sperm function. Despite being non-specific for identifying male infertility etiologies, semen analysis is usually the gateway test from, from which expensive and uh, often more invasive treatment, treatments are based. So therefore, the importance of a reliable andrology laboratory cannot be underestimated. Experienced technicians, internal and externally uh, quality control, validation of test systems, quality assurance are some aspects to consider when choosing a laboratory to perform your semen analysis requests. We strictly follow the 2010 WHO manual for the basic semen analysis, including its proposed reference values. However, we created a dedicated template reporting, including the patient values and the reference 95% distribution. We compare the patient results with those of the lower limit and the 50 centiles. And we use this information in, in that of the clinical history and physical examination to determine the need for additional tests for diagnosis, counseling, and treatment. In many cases, sperm DNA fragmentation is included as a test of sperm function. We use the sperm chromatin dispersion test in our routine clinical practice. And here you can see how our uh, seminal analysis report looks like. We follow guidelines recommendations for SDF testing. According to the study group for DNA fragmentation guideline, there are seven main clinical scenarios in which SDF testing may be recommended. They include varicocele, particularly in case of palpable varicocele and borderline or normal routine semen analysis, unexplained and idiopathic infertility, recurrent pregnancy loss before IUI and ART, in case of infertility risk factors and before cryobanking. In these conditions, SDF testing may confirm the contribution of sperm DNA damage to infertility and possibly guide the treatment plan. The endocrine evaluation is particularly indicated in the presence of low sperm count, erectile dysfunction, or signs of hypogonadism. The primary goals are to identify conditions associated with the testicular deficiencies that may be treated. With regards to additional testing, we usually order these tests uh, based on the results of their history, physical exam, and semen analysis. 
So ge genetic abnormalities are relatively common in men suffering from infertility, particularly those with uh, oligosospermia or azospermia. In patients with uh, no obstructive azospermia and severe oligosospermia, karyotype and Y microdeletion studies are routine, while uh, cystic fibrosis transmembrane uh, receptor gene mutations are used in case of obstructive azospermia involving the vas deferens agenesis. If there is a family history of, of uh, recurrent uh, pregnancy loss, malformations, or mental retardation, karyotype analysis should be requested regardless of the sperm concentration. The results of genetic testing are used for both counseling and treatment planning. Imaging studies may be helpful in selected cases. For example, um, scrotal doper ultrasound when it is difficult to examine the scrotum of obese patients, uh, in patients with hydrocele or uh, uh, high right testes. We also perform ultrasound examination if any abnormal scroll findings are detected on physical examination or in men at increased risk of malignancy, such as those with a history of cryptorchidism. Transrectal ultrasound is indicated of, for patients in whom uh, ejaculatory duct obstruction is suspected. Transrectal ultrasound can detect vesico, uh, seminal vesicle abnormalities and prostatic cysts. For some men with uh, ejaculatory duct obstruction, treatment to relieve the obstruction can be offered. Besides, uh, transrectal ultrasound can confirm congenital bilateral genesis of the vas deferens, as the seminal vesicles in these patients are either absent or hypoplasic. MRI is helpful to assess the distal parts of the seminal tract the presence of prolactinomas and an intraabdominal location of an undescended testis eventually. Finally, diagnostic testicular biopsy, which rarely indicate in the male infertility workup. Uh, however, in very selected cases, it may help to distinguish obstructive azospermia from non-obstructive azospermia. For example, in men with a normal FSH and normal testicular size without any apparent signs of obstruction. Our biopsies are performed using percutaneous or open approaches. The specimen is placed in bovine solutions uh, and sent to histopathology examination. Histopathology results clearly indicate if spermatogenesis impairment exists. It also has predictive value concerning the chances of finding sperm during a sperm retrieval attempt. In our settings, a diagnostic biopsy specimen is also examined fresh in the IVF laboratory. In the presence of sperm, we offer our patients the possibility of immediate sperm cryobanking. So in conclusion, male infertility has been increasingly recognized as a medical condition and public health concern. Its prevention and management are integral part components of a comprehensive sexual and reproductive uh, health service. A well-conducted male infertility workup has the potential to reveal relevant underlying medical and infertility conditions, many of which may be treated or alleviated. In cases of irreversible conditions, the male infertility workup may help guide the optimal application of assisted reproductive technology. The final goals are to positively impact the overall male health, pregnancy prospects, and offspring well-being. So that brings us to the end. Uh, once again, thank you very much for your participation and your attention. And um, now I, I think we can move on to the polling session. So if you can bring the, uh, the polling session, please. So uh, I will ask the, all attendees to please click on the, uh, the pulling icon on the right-hand side of your screen so you can all follow the multiple choice questions and vote. So first question is, which of the following medication class is potentially gonna be toxic? Select one, a penicillin, B, hydroxychloroquine, C, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, 
D, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, and E, furosemide. Um, I can already see the, uh, I'll give you guys plus 10 seconds to answer. So, so far I can see that, uh, well, it's still running. Okay, so I think we, we can wrap this one up. Um, so as I, as I can see here, the most voted answer was uh, C. That's correct. Yeah. So it's C, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Uh, that's the correct answer. Uh, the best clinical evidence nowadays uh, from literature uh, states that uh, Serotonin reuptake inhibitors can diminish sperm count and motility, and sometimes even enhance the uh, DNA fragmentation. I think we can move on to the next question then. So karyotype and Y chromosome analysis should be offered to select one. A, men with a norm stroke of ospermia and severe oligospermia before performing XC. B, all men with primary infertility. C, men with sperm concentration lower than 15 million per ml. D, men with primary infertility and hypogonadism. And E, not included in the evaluation of male infertility. Uh, so for this one, most people answered letter A. Men with no obstructive zoospermia and severe oligosospermia before performing ICSI. Uh, that is the correct answer. Uh, we know that uh, the most common uh, change in karyotype in this uh, scenario is Klinefelter syndrome. And uh, Y chromosome should be, uh, microdeletion should be searched for when you have a severe oligosospermia scenario usually when you have less than five to 10 million uh, sperm per ml. And it may guide your treatment plan. So let's move on to the last question. A 35 year old male is being evaluated for azospermia. He has, he has normal size tests and palpable vas deferens. His FSH levels are normal. His ejaculate volume is two, in two different samples is less than, than one ml and semen pH is less than seven. It has pain with ejaculation and a decreased urine stream. What would you do next? Select one. A, repeat semen analysis. B, LH and testosterone levels. C, transrectal ultrasound. D, scrotal ultrasound. And E, genetic testing. So most people answered letter C, transrectal ultrasound. That is the correct answer. Uh, it's clearly uh, suspected that there is uh, ejaculatory duct obstruction in this scenario. So transrectal ultrasound might identify the cause of this obstruction and perhaps uh, allow for a, a disobstruction procedure that could give this patient a chance to show some sparing the ejaculate. So with that, uh, we close this pulling section and I think we can move on to the next session. Thank you very much. And I hand it over to the Dr. Sandra again. Thank you. Uh, Ricardo, um, uh, thank you for uh, intervention. We have to move over to the Q&A session. Uh, we invite all participants to post questions in the Q&A session on your right screen as Peter explained to you at the beginning. Um, this is a time for you uh, that where well, you have the opportunity uh, to find out more about these topics and ask questions to the expert. You may also post anonymously your questions. We will try during the section to answer, to respond to all the questions live, but uh, we, if we do not have enough time, uh, we will try to respond to them individually offline. 
Um, so I would like to invite the faculty to the Q&A and we have already received a question from Anna from Germany. Would Peter, you mind and read it, please? Yes, definitely. Oh. But, first of, but first of all, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, congratulate you, Ricardo. It was an excellent lecture, an excellent overview of something which a lot of our colleagues actually live under the delusion that as long as we've got 10 sperms, we're going to get a pregnancy. Now, those of us who are more into the whole DNA fragmentation issue and lifestyle issue know that this is not the fact and that we are actually, in many cases, over-examining our the ladies the, the 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 women and we forget the males because we just believe it's sufficient with with the semen analysis and i think you showed this very very elegantly and i hope even for europe because it's a huge problem in europe also i hope for europe also that we're gonna improve our standards in terms of of investigation of the male now coming back to the question well uh, one question here is what, for you, Ricardo, what are the illicit drugs with a more significant detrimental effect on fertility? So I would consider, if I understand that, the illicit drugs would be the pharma, pharma, pharmacology yeah. agents that we use yeah. uh, in, in clinical practice. So yeah. I would point out uh, serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitors as an important one because it's very frequently our patients use it and uh, especially those with uh, premature ejaculation. So they tend to use it and chronically. And we have some, uh, some data nowadays showing that it can decrease sperm count, motility, and especially peroxetine may enhance the DNA fragmentation. So we have to be aware of those. Uh, calcium channel blockers may impair um, sperm motility and decrease the, their fertilization capacity. And I would say uh, some other ones like uh, nitrofurantoin, uh, allopurinol and colchicine should be remembered. Thank you very much. And I can just add, uh, just recently I had a, a mail from a patient I don't know who has undergone a series of treatment and was wondering himself whether paroxetine could have, had an, could have had a negative effect. He had never been informed about trying to reduce or doing any DNA fragmentation testing. I could just tell him, well, and I forwarded him the, the paper from the Tilstoril in which this was examined already back in 2011. So yes, I think this is very important. I have another question for you because this is now, we're moving into the era of DNA fragmentation testing. And the question here is, how often do you test in, do, in your clinic? And do you, in reality, should we recommend DNA testing for all patients, for all males enrolled in the ART program? So two questions. Ricardo. Yeah, so Peter, I, I'll start from the second one. I, I think that we're moving towards that situation where we're going to be asking sperm functional tests for everyone as it gains uh, uh, more uh, literature data and people start to understand that it plays a major role on the ART development. But in our clinic, uh, we try to stick to the, the, the sperm DNA fragmentation uh, guidelines that have been published by a group that uh, I think uh, Sandro uh, coordinated. And so that includes patients with uh, varicocele, failed previous treatment, recurrent uh, pregnancy loss, um, idiopathic uh, infertility. Um, so I think uh, those would be uh, nowadays the, the definitive uh, indications for uh, sperm functional tests regarding DNA fragmentation. And Ricardo, I also just need to ask, like we could ask Sandro also, both of you, because, you know, in Europe, it's been uh, for many years, it's been, oh, can we lie? We, we have got so many DNA tests, DNA fragmentation testing, and they show different results, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the whole issue of DNA fragmentation until quite recently has been uh, like having like an, a negative air about it. So what are your comments to this today now, 2021? Well, um, my impression is that uh, it do doesn't matter which test you use, uh, as long as you have a good quality control and you, you, you have a laboratory that defines a clear cutoff value for your abnormality identification. So in Androfair, we use the sperm chromatin test, dispersion test, and we've been using for several years now. And I think it's a very reliable tool for you to plan your treatment uh, uh, regarding how you're going to take the ART or which sperm uh, source you're going to use. So I think it's, it's solid by, by now, but uh, I don't know if Sandro has yeah. a different view. 
Now, yeah, the same view. The issue is that, Peter, we have uh, four main, main sperm DNA fragmentation tests that we can reliably use in the clinic. This is the sperm chromatin dispersion test, SCSA, the Tunnel SA, and the Comet SA. These tests, they do not actually look into the same, let's say, issues but they correlate. There's a good correlation among these tests overall. However, the interpretation is important for the clinician because the thresholds are not uh, exactly the same. So in the guidelines that we prepared, in which you also contributed, it's published open access in Andrologia journal. Everyone can access it. It's also available in the library. We actually try to include uh, experts from the laboratory uh, stand, uh, standpoint in which they provided clear recommendations on how to conduct and interpret this test. So Ricardo is, is, is right when he says that it's important to have a quality control in running the tests. We do it with positive and negative quality control. Uh, the sperm DNA fragmentation test, to my point of view, is not a replacement for the semen analysis, is not a replacement for the good medical history, physical examination. But I think this is a, something that we could also add to the armamentarium we have the semen analysis is not enough. There's a lot of overlapping between fertile and infertile couples. There are many limitations in, in the semen analysis and the evaluation of sperm DNA integrity can help us to identify contribution of um, impaired DNA to infertility and also probably help us to identify underlying factors that could be corrected, or if not possible to correct these factors, we can guide the best op, uh, optimal assisted reproductive technology to use. So thank you. Lorella, have we got more time? Because I've got some more questions here. I have more time. We have more time. We are okay. perfectly on time. Good. So uh, Ricardo, this is for you again. Now you talked about the Rick seal. And uh, it's the question here is, do we have to confirm the physical findings by scrotal ultrasound? And in the case of a left pal uh, palpable varicocele and a contralateral subclinical varicocele, do you recommend a bilateral varicocele repair? Well, uh, that's a very good question, Peter. And so first of all, for the physical examination, it, should, it, it must be clear for everyone that the diagnosis of varicocele is based on the physical exam. So you have to have the patient standing on a warm room. And if it's visible or palpable, either at rest or under Valsalva maneuver, then you have a clinical vertical seal. So ultrasound should be used only when you, were, uh, you, you think your physical examination is not reliable. Or in my personal view, I think it's useful when you have a clinical left, usually left vertical seal, and you have a clear indication for surgical management. Then I, ha I usually have an ultrasound made just to make uh, to diagnose if there is a subclinical contralateral one. So in that case, and that leads us to the second answer, uh, mm -hmm. I usually do a bilateral correction. So the most recent data regarding this matter uh, shows that there is room for uh, improvement of bilateral correction over the uh, correction of uh, only the, the, the clinical side. And it suggests that, that there might be an impact also in uh, pregnancy rates. So um, I think so. I think uh, you should correct both sides when you have a left clinical vertical seal and a subclinical right vertical seal. Thank you very much. I could just say that at least locally in Denmark, I think quite a lot of our urologists are, are very hesitant to do any vertical seal repair by the, on the diagnosis of infertility we face often a lot of discussion and problems because they are afraid of a trophy of the testes, etc. Can you comment on this? Uh, yes, but, well, I, I think the, the surgical approach is very safe, uh, but you, you, you really have to do it with, with the best uh, um, uh, techniques that you have available now. So I don't think that there is any doubt that nowadays the best way to approach this, approach this is with, is with uh, microsurgical uh, uh, surgery, right? So... Uh, that gives you a lot of uh, security not to cause any damage to the artery. You can also use uh, intraoperative Doppler uh, uh, if you have it available. That will make you uh, easily identify the artery. 
and uh, preserve the lymphatics and also the uh, the healthy veins. So it's a I, I would say it's a very very safe procedure, and um, I think the this this risk of uh, accidents intraoperatively are very low. Ricardo, I'd also like you to comment on ab uh, on the importance of uh, the abstinence time, specifically for DNA fragmentation. Could you comment on this? Yeah, so uh, uh, DNA fragmentation uh, uh, enhancement has been linked to uh, abstinence time, so in a, in a linear way. So we know that uh, part of the ox oxidative stress uh, is caused by the sperm transit uh, uh, through the epididymis. So uh, when we wanted to bring it down, the DNA fragmentation, we can use more frequent ejaculations in serial ejaculations and a shorter abstinence time. So here in Androfert, when we want to assess the patient's DNA fragmentation uh, only, specifically, uh, we orient them to have a less than 24 hour abstinence time for that collection. And for uh, therapeutic purpose, sometimes we make them undergo sequential uh, ejaculations following the publication by Gonzalez and collaborators. So Peter, uh, if I may add something, I think we, um, in terms of the um, DNA fragmentation, according to the WHO manual for the semen analysis, it is recommended that for the routine semen analysis, we have between two and seven days. We usually, for the semen analysis here, we do two to three days. And for this, for the sperm DNA fragmentation, for a diagnostic, let's say, mm -hmm. test, we prefer to have it two days because we are still within the WHO recommendations, two days. We know, as Ricardo said, that the higher the abstinence time, the higher the sperm DNA fragmentation. We have published on that other groups as well. So if you want to have a report, I would suggest that the doctors ask the patients to have two uh, between two and three days um, ejaculatory abstinence. Well, if you see a patient with high uh, DNA fragmentation, what do you need to do is that that is an alert that the reproductive urologist or the doctor has to look into more detail. Is there any lifestyle uh, factor that could be compromising uh, DNA fragmentation, obesity, uh, smoking, uh, drugs? Is there a clinical palpable varicocele? Because we know that varicocele increases sperm DNA fragmentation. Is there subclinical infection? I mean, there are some things that we need to treat. It could be varicoselectomy, it could be antibiotics for, I mean, infection. It could be uh, instructing the patient to change the lifestyle, or it could be something that, well, we don't have anything to do, so I will provide you empirical treatment that could be antioxidants. We can discuss more about that if there's time or any treatments, including FSH, uh, exogenous FSH has been shown to decrease sperm DNA fragmentation. And in ART, and then we need to see if the patient is candidate for having testicular sperm retrieval, uh, because it has been shown that testicular sperm has low DNA fragmentation because it ha have not under undergone, let's say, the epididymis transit in which the oxidative stress is more remarkable. So, I mean, there are, things we can do, uh, and I would suggest the doctors to uh, ask the patients to have two to three days abstinence for the sperm DNA fragmentation and interpret the test accordingly. So uh, one of the four tests that I mentioned before are suitable for sperm DNA fragmentation analysis. Okay, so I have some, uh, some more questions here. So do you repeat the DNA fragment? So the first question is, okay, you've got a male and now his sperm DMF, uh, DNA fragmentation is increased, it's high. What is the next step? And second question, with this guy, whatever you do, are you gonna re repeat the DNA fragmentation testing? Whatever, whatever, let's say, whatever intervention you go for. Sandro. Yeah, the interventions I mentioned before, I mean, yeah. I, we do a, a comprehensive evaluation. So I try to identify any underlying factor that we could modify. Sometimes we need to combine. It's a patient which is overweight, uh, smokes, and then we will advise accordingly. And there is a palpable vertical seal. While you talk to my patient, let's go and have this vertical seal repair. Always take into consideration the female partner because we need to take also into account the ovarian reserve. I mean, the age of the patient, the, 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 the woman, 
in order actually to provide the best possible treatment. So this is in, in agreement with our, uh, our uh, staff of reproductive endocrinology. So we discuss these cases together to provide the patients the best approach. But if I provide some treatment, it's important to understand that any single intervention in male infertility, we need to understand that spermatogenesis will take about 78 days. So one thing for good or one thing for bad, we need to allow, let's say, the spermatogenesis to kind of uh, occur and then to analyze a different sperm cohort, we need about two to three months. So if I um, promote an intervention, it could be varicoselectomy, quit smoking, et cetera, I will ask this patient, well, let's repeat the test three months later. And then again, using the same abstinence time. So if the first test was done with two days abstinence, I would make sure that the repeat test is also mm -hmm. done with the same ejaculatory abstinence because then we are on the same page. Excellent. Now, uh, also a question which has been posed here. Peter, uh, we have time just for one question okay. and then we have to move on. So, so this is a short one. So uh, any known effect of COVID infection on DNA fragmentation? So any report as of yet on the correlation between COVID and DNA fragmentation? Not to my knowledge. Uh, well, we have been following these publications. What we know now is that it looks like COVID is not sexual transmissible. There ha there's, uh, have been some reports of the virus in the testes using electron microscopy, some also reports of, a, um, of detection of virus in the semen. But I mean, most reports are against this concept. They show that they could not find, let's say, direct evidence of virus uh, in the semen or in the testicle. But Peter, it's important that uh, everyone realize that the fever related to COVID and also the cytokine storm, the inflammation, it's kind of very important. And what we see and others are seeing as well is that the semen analysis results decline after a symptomatic COVID infection. So what we are uh, telling our patients who have got COVID is that I want to repeat the semen analysis uh, and I try to postpone a little bit treatment two, three months later because I'm concerned that the results I have got before are not the same uh, at the time the patient presents just recovered of COVID. So we can have a very bad surprise of a patient, let's say he was moderate oligozoospermic, let's say 5 million ml, and now this patient is just cryptozoospermic after symptomatic COVID, and you are preparing an IVF cycle, and on the day of oocyte pickup, you have this big surprise. So what we are doing here, we are following the literature. We are also following our patients. You, everyone know COVID is, is a big problem for us now in Brazil. Uh, we see these patients in the clinic, um, and we, uh, they recover. They come back for treatment, and we are saying these patients to have uh, repeat semen analysis, repeat sperm DNA fragmentation for us to have a better picture of next steps. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you, Peter. I have to drop in. We have to move on. I'd like to thank all the attendees because we are receiving many questions. And as I said at the beginning, if we and not, um, let's, let's put it this way, if we cannot answer to all of them, we will do it uh, offline. So um, we will now move forward uh, to the next topic. I hope that you had the opportunity uh, to watch the video lectures available on the website. But uh, Sandra now uh, will uh, summarize lesson number four entitled Medical Treatment, uh, What Can Be Done to Improve Natural Fertility and ART Outcomes. And so, Sandro, to you. Thank you very much, Lorela. It's now my pleasure to summarize lesson four, Medical Treatment of Male Infertility, What Can Be Done to Improve Natural Fertility and ART Outcomes. Uh, this full talk is available on the preceptorship web website for those who had not seen it yet. So thank you again, the time out for being here with me today. The outline of what was covered in this talk was male factors that can be potentially treated with medication 
how to treat and the results obtained, and some practical tips on how to use pharmacotherapy in clinical practice. So the, uh, the three main male factors potentially treated with medications are the bacterial genital tract infections, hormonal disturbances, and idiopathic infertility. So male genital tract infection, we call it MAGI, is a potentially curable cause of male infertility. We have bacterial infections that are the most common. Uh, many of these bacterial infections are sexually transmitted, and they are often asymptomatic. They can cause urethritis, prostatitis, orchitis, and epididymitis. The semen analysis can help indicate the presence of infection. So for instance, when we have an increased concentration of leukocytes in the semen, it might indicate the presence of inflammation, although it's not necessarily associated with bacterial or viral infections. So leukocytospermia is defined as over 1 million white blood cells per ml of semen. So we have then uh, microbial pathogens that will activate seminal leukocytes. Seminal leukocytes will generate a significant amount of reactive oxygen species. And these free radicals can damage sperm membranes, sperm DNA, affecting sperm quality potentially. So the easiest way to confirm leukocytospermia is by using the peroxidase test. This is the test recommended by the WHO manual. The test detects the presence of peroxidase, an enzyme that breaks down hydrogen peroxide and that exists inside granulocytes, but do not exist on immature germ cells. So the peroxidase positive cells stay in brown and can be easily identified using bright field microscopy. Why this differentiation is important? It is important because leukocytes and immature germ cells are round in shape. So looking at the microscope, we cannot differentiate unless we use a staining. So in our semen analysis report, we always provide information about the numbers of round cells and also uh, the positive peroxidase cells for the clinicians to make an evaluation of potential uh, clinical or subclinical infection. So in patients with leukocytospermia, we usually prescribe a broad antibacterial spectrum agent against gram-negative and gram-positive pathogens, also chlamydia and urea plasma, like for instance, azithromycin, which is given as a single dose. The sexual partner has to take it too. And we ask the patients to have frequent ejaculations. This is also important. So our data show that about half of the treated patients show resolution of leukocytospermia, which is usually associated with improved semen quality. So if leukocytospermia persists after four weeks of treatment, then we do urine and semen culture that could help identify the, the pathogenic microorganism, which is then treated accordingly. So a concentration of over 1,000 colony forming units per ml in the ejaculate is indicative of persistent infection. But for chlamydia and urea plasma and gonococcal infections, the most accurate method for diagnosis is the PCR. So despite that, uh, the clinical significance of a confirmed infection or increased concentration of similar leukocytes on fertility is not very clear. Uh, However, it seems that chronic prostatitis has a deleterious effect on uh, sperm quality, uh, as, as well urea plasma and, and mycoplasma. So antibiotic treatment often uh, will be able to completely eliminate the microorganisms. However, it has some limited effect on inflammatory alterations and antibiotic treatment will not be able to reverse the post-infection functional deficits and anatomical sequelae that can happen, uh, mainly when the, the problem affects the epididymis. So other agents like anti-inflammatory drugs, antioxidants have been used. In general, these treatments may improve sperm quality, although they do not necessarily improve pregnancy probability. We need more data on this field. As for hormonal abnormalities, Hypogonadotropic hypogonadism represents the best case scenario for pharmacotherapy. 
Hypohypo is caused by congenital problems like Kalman syndrome, but it can also be secondary to pituitary surgery or uh, testosterone replacement therapy, just to give you two examples. So regardless of the cause, hypohypo is characterized by decreased levels of FSH, LH, and testosterone. We see a patient with very low FSH, LH, and testosterone. Usually these patients will have poor vitalization and azospermia. These are common characteristics. Why as azospermia? Because there's lack of testicular stimulation by the pituitary gonadotropins. So it's easy to manage these patients. Pharmacotherapy with exogenous gonadotropins is highly effective to induce spermatogenesis with reported pregnancy rates of up to 65%, which are achieved naturally or with use of IUI and ART. In men with congenital, I mean like from the, uh, from the childhood, hypohypo, our uh, treatment regimen is HCG, administered subcutaneously in a dose that varies from 2,500 to 5,000 international units twice a week. And for um, um, childhood onset hypohypo, we our, always combine HCG with FSH. We use 150 international units, recombinant FSH, given subcutaneously twice a week. So for men with adult onset hypohypo, for instance, if the patient has been uh, undergoing long testosterone replacement therapy or a pituitary surgery, I mean, the patient was normal before. So the uh, germ cells were primed with FSH and LH, but now FSH and LH is missing. We usually start with HCG alone in doses varying from 1,000 to 5,000 international units twice a week. And then we add FSH, in particular recombinant FSH in the treatment course as needed, depending on the sperm count. So the goals here are to have sperm in the ejaculate uh, in number and quality good enough to allow this man to establish a pregnancy either naturally or using IUI or ART, depending on the female uh, partner condition. So our experience has shown that higher sperm count is achieved with the combination of HCG and FSH versus HCG alone, but still there's lack of randomized control trials comparing drugs and regimens. So the, usually the treatment takes several months, usually six months or more. And during this period, we need to check the hormone levels, semen analysis to adjust the medication accordingly. We always discuss sperm banking with our patients because they will become infertile again when the injections are stopped. What is critical to remember to all of us is that exogenous testosterone should never be used to treat patients with hypohypo. Testosterone injections promote supraphysiological circulating testosterone levels, but the intratesticular testosterone, I mean the, tes the testosterone that is produced inside the testicle, critical for normal spermatogenesis remains very low. Uh, exogenous testosterone should never be prescribed actually to the general population of infertile men. For instance, sometimes these patients come to the office with low circulating testosterone levels. The urologist, the doctor might be inclined to prescribe testosterone. This is not correct because these supraphysiological testosterone levels will inhibit the pituitary gland causing then what we call iatrogenic hypohypo and the azospermia. So if you want to boost intratesticular testosterone production in men, for instance, with hypohypo, we need to use HCG. Lastly, I want just to briefly discuss medical therapy for men with idiopathic infertility. So these men with idiopathic infertility, by the definition, they have no obvious history or fertility problems. The physical examination and endocrine assessments are also normal, but routine semen analysis reveals semen abnormalities. For example, low sperm count, motility, or morphology, which come alone or in combination. So several agents have been advocated as possible empirical treatment, including selective estrogen receptor modulators, aromatase inhibitors, and gonadotropins. 
So selective estrogen receptor modulators, they work by blocking estrogen receptors at the hypothalamus. Then there is an increase in the GnRH secretion, and consequently, there's an increase in FSH and LH secretion. So there seems to be an improvement in sperm and hormonal parameters according to a recent meta-analysis, but very few studies uh, actually are placebo controlled and the overall quality of data is low, making the European Association of Urology in its male infertility guidelines state that no conclusive recommendations can be made at present. So they add a note of caution as complications with use of the selective estrogen receptor modulators, such as hot flushes and thromboembolism, are underreported. Also, even low doses of 25 milligrams clomiphene citrate daily may, in some cases, cause excessive testosterone production. I mean, excessive in terms of supraphysiological testosterone levels that will suppress the pituitary and decrease sperm count which can be detrimental to these men with already reduced sperm numbers. So monitoring the blood levels of testosterone is essential if you plan to use this class of drug. So also given the importance of FSH, the endogenous FSH on spermatogenesis, uh, a lot of interest has been uh, uh, given to FSH therapy using exogenous FSH in idiopathic male infertility. There's some evidence indicating that FSH injections increases sperm count, reduces sperm DNA fragmentation, and may result in higher life birth rates compared with placebo or no treatment. The most common protocols use either urinary or recombinant FSH, which are administered subcutaneously two to three times a week for three to six months in doses varying from 75 to 300 international. Use it widely. I've been using widely uh, in male with idiopathic infertility. They have a great appeal because oxidative stress is a critical contributing factor in the pathogenesis of male infertility. The free radicals are generated by the leukocytes and also by abnormal sperm and can affect sperm function through plasma membrane lipid peroxidation and DNA damage. So the latest Cochrane meta analysis concluded that antioxidants had a positive impact on live birth in infertile couples undergoing ART, but data on live birth was available for only about 700 patients. Also, the decrease in sperm DNA fragmentation, according to this study, with use of antioxidant therapy was not statistically significant. Or of note, there is the recent males antioxidants and infertility MOXI trial uh, that found that antioxidants did not improve sperm parameters or DNA integrity compared to placebo uh, when used in infertile couples with male factor infertility. So at present, no clear conclusions are possible regarding the clinical utility of antioxidants in diopathic male infertility because of the critical limitations of these published studies. We still don't know the optimal therapeutic regimen, duration, dosing, nor the ideal candidates for improving sperm parameters and pregnancy rates. We have been prescribing a combination of antioxidants to our male infertility patients empirically for several, several years. But as I said before, we still don't know the optimal therapeutic regimen, duration dosing, and these candidates that might benefit for uh, antioxidant therapy. If you decide to use it, uh, this is the formula that we prescribe our patients. We ask a pharmacy to prepare this formula. They take every day, but they don't take it at once. We ask the patient to split the dose in two uh, uh, takes because it's not possible to absorb all the vitamins at one, uh, only one administration. And if you decide to use it, remember the spermatogenic cycle of about 78 days. So that concludes my short summary on medical treatment. Let's now summarize the main points. 
first pharmacotherapy has a role in male infertility. The main candidates include patients with genital tract infections, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, hyperprolactinemia, and idiopathic infertility. Second, antibiotics uh, eliminates bacterial infections in the general tract, but the effect of treatment on the odds of achieving pregnancy remains equivocal. Gonadotropin therapy using HCG alone or combined with FSH is highly effective to stimulate spermatogenesis in men with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Treatment can neither restore natural fertility or allow ART treatment to be carried out. And lastly, pharmacotherapy using selective estrogen receptor modulators, aromatase inhibitors, and antioxidants may improve sperm quantity or quality when given to men with idiopathic infertility, but the quality of that is overall poor to make clear recommendations. A notable exception seems to be FSH therapy that has shown by randomized controlled trials to improve sperm quantity and quality and has translated into increased pregnancy rates. So thank you very much. And now I think it's time for us to move to the, to the to the pooling. So if you go for lesson, now you need to go for lesson four. Click pooling, please. And then we will have the first question shown to you. So the first question is, um, I think I can read it now. Which test is recommend, oh, sorry. Those is lesson four. So here we have a 28-year-old man uh, reports delayed puberty onset and decreased libido. His physical exam, exam reveals scanty body hair. His testicles are small, about 12 cc. Semen analysis shows low volume azospermia. Serum LH, FSH, and testosterone levels are very low. So which disorder could explain these findings? So here uh, we have four options, primary hypothyroidism, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, prolactin secreting pituitary tumor, primary testicular failure, and androgen um, insensitivity. So we have more people responding the right one. So this patient has hypogonadotropic hypogonadism because of the very low FSH, LH, testosterone levels, small testicles, delayed puberty onset, we should, and azospermia. So we should always suspect of hypo-hypo. So 95% of participants uh, responded correctly. Uh, now I want to move to the second uh, multiple choice question. Which test is recommended by the WHO manual for the detection of seminal leukocytes? Options are uh, quantification of round cells by phase microscopy, uh, peroxidase test, uh, immunohistology for CD45 antigen, flow cytometry with monoclonal antibodies and seminal elastase levels. So here again, uh, vast majority responded correctly. This is the peroxidase test. So uh, some people responded quantification of round cells by phase microscopy. Well, remember what I said during my presentation that we will not be able to differentiate between the, ger uh, the immature germ cells and the um, leukocytes by just going for phase microscopy because these are round cells. We need some staining. Now I want to move to the last um, to the last one, last multiple choice question for uh, 
also related to the case of the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Remember that case, 28-year-old man with uh, delayed puberty onset um, and small tests, low FSH, low testosterone, whatever. So now the question is, what kind of treatment would you recommend for that particular patient? So a patient with um, childhood onset hypohypo, would that be selective estrogen receptor modulator, cabergolin, testosterone replacement therapy, HCG injections, or the combination between HCG and plus FSA injections? I can see again that most people responded correctly. Just few people respond in cabegolin, but remember this patient has no prolactinoma, so there's no point here for using uh, cabegolin. Also, selective estrogen receptor modulator will not make any any improvement because there is a lack of FSH and LH. This patient has a childhood onset hypohypo. So if you prescribe selective estrogen receptor modulator, you won't be able to increase FSH and LH levels because the pituitary is not able to kind of make that, that uh, increase. So the correct one is HCG plus FSH injections. And with that, I would like to thank you very much. I close the, the pooling and uh, hand it back to Lorela and Peter for starting the Q&A. The sound, okay. Thank you very much, Sandra. Uh, let's move over to the Q&A session. Can I make a question? It's more a curiosity. From your experience, how difficult it is? I know that uh, the questions that we are receiving are very technical lens from the specialization, but I have uh, a curiosity. From your experience, how difficult it is to convince men that maybe the infertility problem is um, of the couple depends from the male and not from the woman, uh, because uh, for ages we have seen infertility problem uh, just as a woman's one. Well, this is a very important question because some, in some uh, cases, the men are very reluctant to actually go for the evaluation. In certain countries, it's like infertility is a female issue. But we, the global estimates are very clear, Lorela. 50% of cases are either male factor infertility alone or combined with female infertility factors. So, I mean, it's important to increase awareness uh, about male infertility. I feel that this ice is breaking somehow, it's melting. Uh, Peter, for instance, Peter recently launched a book uh, about male infertility you know, Peter, as a reproductive endocrinologist, uh, uh, I mean, an expert across the world in female infertility, he found it very important to increase awareness of male infertility uh, also among uh, the Danish population. So perhaps Peter could also share with us his experience with the launch of this book, which was not a technical book, but it was a textbook, a, gui a guide for, for the layman uh, population. Thank you very much. No, it's been a great experience. And Lorella, I think what we have to say about the male is that obviously after this initial uh, hard blow to his mental and, and let's say his, his perception of being a male, uh, the male would do whatever you want him to do to improve his semen quality if possible. So I usually say, and this is not just only me, but also psychologists, that in terms of trying to to get a better semen quality and quantity, you, the male is an excellent patient. Just this morning, I met this guy who lost 12 kilos, who started exercising, who completely changed his lifestyle because he was told that he his semen quantity was low. And luckily, he actually significantly increased his semen quantity. Now, we didn't measure his DFI, but if we did so, according to my knowledge and studies that we did in lifestyle intervention, we also see that this whole lifestyle intervention idea, specifically the weight loss and the, the physical eye exercise, has a significant impact on DNA fragmentation. So I think it's very, very important from a religious, from a historical, perspective the infertility has always been placed on 
the, the woman. We still see it in certain areas of the world. You will have a, a, a husband with asospermia and he's going to marry repeatedly, uh, although the problem is with him. He doesn't realize, he doesn't want to realize that the problem is with him. So we need a lot of focus on this. And regarding my book, which was obviously for lay people in Denmark, it it, it had a lot of public interest. So I've been on television and in, uh, in, on the radio, in a lot of journals, because again, uh, sperm is something we don't talk about. Sperm is connected to to um, uh, to something dirty, you could say. It's sex. Uh, we don't talk about sperm. We talk about a lot about eggs because we think of the egg like the Easter egg. It's something wonderful, but the sperm is something uh, connected to masturbation, to sex, to sex, which we don't want to talk about. And this is like from a religious and historical perspective. But today, in 2021, we definitely need to take it up. And just in Denmark, we know that 20% of males, in 20% of our males, the sperm quality is, is so poor that they, are, that they will need some kind of assistance to conceive. And 25% of all Danish males will never father a child. So this is a huge problem. I totally agree with, with you, Lorella. Lorella. We need to make the males aware of the fact that they also carry a lot of burden on their shoulder and they need to improve their lifestyle to be able to send off the highest, maybe not quantity, but the highest quality of semen, not only to obtain a pregnancy, but also as was, as was mentioned recently by Eitken, also to secure the health of that child to reduce the the, uh, the all the the side effects in terms of uh, of childhood cancers leukemia and also uh, mental disorders which we see in kids perceived from from specifically uh, older uh, males who, who who have their children so we need to be aware of this so information is the key for a better acknowledgement. Uh, we need to inform uh, men. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. and, yeah. and Lorella, maybe, so, maybe I can just add, because I think this is a very important, a very recent American study also focused on the fact that there is actually also biological aging in the male, which is completely new. We've all been talking and hearing about the this cutoff of 35 years of the uh, of age of the woman. But in this study, the, the American study, including more than 25,000 males, there's a, there's a huge increase in DNA fragmentation from the age of 40, 40 to the age of 50, telling us that even for the male, there is a biological clock ticking. And if we want to if we want to have our kids above the age of 40, we definitely cannot do a lot against biology, but we can do a lot to, uh, for our lifestyle to reduce the negative impact of this. Pope Francisco yesterday at the natality event that we was talking in Rome, he just spoke about that, you know, the fact that uh, uh, we have we want children too late and often they don't arrive. But uh, you have some questions uh, for uh, Sandro that you have received uh, on our. Um, yes, I certainly yeah. do, uh, Sandro, because uh, I think I know you published a very excellent paper and we can refer and it's probably in the library also. But briefly, now you talked about HCG treatment and FSH treatment. And I just want to I just want to make you clarify how do you monitor? How often do you monitor? Which parameters do you monitor when you medically treat the, 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 the male infant infertile patient? So thank you, Peter. Well, uh, related to hypo hypo, uh, in which we give HCG, as I explained, for the adult onset hypo, hypo we start with HCG and I monitor every four weeks. So what I like to do, I go and ask the patient to have a blood test. Blood test includes FSH, uh, testosterone, total testosterone levels at the minimum, but usually I expand the panel. And what I ask is FSH, LH, total testosterone, free testosterone, SHBG, because it's important also for the overweight and obese patients to see how much testosterone is actually free, circulating, 
And I also uh, order estradiol levels to kind of make the ratio between testosterone and estradiol to see which cases there is uh, aromatase hyperactivity in which I need to add aromatase inhibitors. So basically every four weeks, I like to look at the, the blood test. Well, when uh, the patient completes three months of treatment, this is the time to start in addition to the blood test that we need to do monthly, also order semen analysis. So then I start actually monitoring my patients with the semen analysis. So I see questions here coming on the dosing and how to adjust. Because for instance, if I use uh, 2,000 international units twice a week and 10,000 units in another patient, how we actually tailor the, the dose? Well, it's important that you do the blood test because the goal is having testosterone levels, which we measure in the peripheric blood, let's say between 350 up to 800 nanograms per deciliter. So this is a wide range. If we can be around 500 nanograms per deciliter, I think we are achieving a good, uh, let's say, target for testosterone. When we add FSH to the treatment protocol, it's important that FSH levels are above 1.5 uh, mil international units per ml. So usually my goal is try to have FSH levels, circulating FSH levels around three. So the, I also titrate the dose of FSH to achieve that goal. So between two and a half to the, and four, FSH is enough for spermatogenesis according to our data. And for testosterone, again, around 500 nanograms per deciliter, I feel it's a good result when we achieve that. So you talked about aromatase inhibitors. Now, I'd like to ask you, how big a percentage of your patients do you need to use aromatase inhibitors, uh, the dose, and how do you monitor this kind of, this part of the treatment? Peter, what we do is, I don't start with aromatase inhibitors. Usually I do what I call testosterone to estradiol ratio. So usually you just take testosterone in nanograms per deciliter and then estradiol levels in picograms per ml and then you just make the ratio. For instance, let's say that you have a patient with 500 nanograms per deciliter, this total testosterone, and you have that same patient with uh, 100 in estradiol levels. So the ratio is below 10. In that case, in this example is like five. So what I say then, that part of testosterone is being converted to estradiol by the aromatase en enzyme. The aromatase enzyme is not only in the adipose tissue, aromatase enzyme is also in the hypothalamus. So it, it's also um, a central uh, aromatization. And when you increase estradiol levels, what happens, it will inhibit the pituitary. So we can have, let's say, a disturbance in the secretion of the pituitary hormones. So it's import, important to monitor testosterone to estradiol levels, particularly in my, in, my, in my experience in overweight and obese patients. These are the patients most likely to kind of have some uh, uh, abnormal testosterone to estradiol ratios. But in it, every time, Peter, that we give HCG treatment, we get some aromatization. Everyone, you, me, we have aromatizing enzymes. So if you get HCG treatment, the estradiol levels will go up. This is normal. It's good uh, up to a certain point because the treatment is working. Uh, but if the testosterone to estradiol ratio goes below 10, this is the time to start aromatase inhibitor. And what I do, I start with one milligram of, this is off-label treatment. It's important to say uh, one milligram anestrozole. We have two options. We have steroidal uh, aromatase inhibitors like testolactone, but in our market here we have uh, non-steroidal aromatase inhibitors, which is anestrozole. You can also use letrozole, but I would advise if you decide to use letrozole to use every other day uh, because this is two point five milligram. And uh, for the nestrozole, I give one milligram uh, 
pill every day. And then again, I monitor this testosterone tristradiol uh, levels. Thank you very if much. If estradiol levels goes very low, it's important to say that the patients can get some erectile dysfunction. They might come with some complaints about libido, erectile dysfunction. So it's also important not to have estradiol levels completely shut down. This is important also for sexual function. So thank you very much. And for those of you who are interested, I'd like to refer you to some of these papers that Sandro has published specifically on how to monitor and how to treat um, infertility uh, medically. Now, uh, there's another question here. You Peter, talked about- is the last one because then we have to move on to okay. the next uh, issue. Good. So, uh, uh, Sandro, there's a question asking, has the role of Kruger's criteria, have they got a role today in modern IVF, in modern, yeah, infertility treatment? Well, Peter, uh, I, this is related to the first lesson. Perhaps Ricardo could jump in, but I feel that the Kruger's morphology is kind of decreasing importance uh, more recently. I mean, a lot of people have been relying on isolated teratosospermia, less than 4% um, normal sperm, even to recommend uh, ICSI. Uh, I feel that isolated teratosospermia has to be interpreted with caution because we have papers showing that even in that condition, I mean, we can have uh, good results using conventional IVF and ICSI. For IUI, it seems that morphology has a role. Uh, overall, when we have below 8% uh, normal um, uh, rates, IUI results will be half as compared to let's say above 8%, uh, but I think that morphology has a role. What I like to do and what we do in our lab is that we like, if the morphology is below 4%, we always have what we call the morphological di uh, discrimination, what kind of defects we have in that particular specimen. For instance, you may be surprised to have a patient with globosospermia. I mean, all sperm losing, uh, lacking the acrosome. Well, this patient will have 0% Kruger's morphology, but the information is so important because we know that that patient, even for ICSI, we should advise this patient that the results are, are suboptimal. So another thing is that, for instance, some patients, they are taking antibiotics and they have, let's say, short tail, but it's kind of, all sperm or um, mid-piece defects. Well, this has been associated also with some poor ART outcomes, even with ICSI. So I, to me, I like to have the morphology as part of the evaluation, but not actually relying on a single parameter mm -hmm. to make my decision. Thank you. Um, so we move on. And we move on with the next uh, speech, summary L7, non-obstructive azospermia, a multidisciplinary clinical approach. We are receiving a lot of upcoming questions. And as we said before, that um, if we, can, if we um, can manage to answer to all of them, we will manage to do it offline. So if you want to continue to send a question, do it. But now we have to move on, on to lesson seven. Sandra, to you. Thank you very much, Lorela. Yeah, thank you all of you for posting questions. It's impressive in the number of questions and the interest that has been um, uh, put, to, put forward by all of you. Thank you very much. We will try to manage these questions. And perhaps if we don't have time today, I will discuss with um, uh, the organizers to have in the, in the website, perhaps a dedicated area in which we can post the answers. Well, now it's my pleasure to summarize the last talk of our team in this year's male infertility preceptorship. We contributed three talks to the program. This one now relates to uh, the clinical management of patients with non-obstructive azospermia. As with the other talks we covered today, the full talk of this one is available in the preceptorship website for those of you who have not seen it yet. So here's an outline of what was covered in this talk. 
Uh, we discussed the differential diagnosis between non-obstructive azospermia with other types of azospermia, the patient counseling about the chance of sperm retrieval success, and pregnancy outcomes using the patient's own sperm. We discussed about medical therapy and varicoselectomy, the role of these interventions before sperm retrieval for men with non-obstructive azospermia, the methods of sperm retrieval that we have available to offer these patients, and lastly, how to most optimally use laboratory techniques for handling testicular sperm and cultivating the embryos resulting from testicular sperm injections. So azospermia, as you know well, is defined by a complete absence of spermatozoa in the ejaculate. So the azospermic ejaculate should be always exempt after centrifugation to exclude cryptozoospermia, that is the presence of few sperm. So azospermia should be confirmed in more than one semen analysis because there's some variation, biological variation, and it's important for that. So in most patients, non-obstructive azospermia may be distinguished from obstructive azospermia with use of history, physical examination, and hormonal analysis. And this differentiation is important because spermatogenesis is preserved in obstructive azospermia. In uh, obstructive azospermia, and we have a dedicated talk by Dr. Matt Coward available in the website, the obstruction can be anywhere along the reproductive tract, for example, the vas deferens, the epididymis, or the ejaculatory duct. So in obstructive azospermia, both reconstructive procedures and sperm retrieval are in general highly successful. By contrast, non-obstructive azospermia is the worst male infertility scenario. It is associated with irreversible conditions that cause spermatogenic failure. Common causes include genetic and congenital abnormalities, post-infectious testicular damage, gonadotoxin, for example, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and also testicular trauma. However, in many cases, the etiology cannot be determined, and we call some cases of non-obstructive azospermia idiopathic. On physical examination, it's common to note the presence of small testicles, along with palpable vas, deferens, and flat epididymis. The FSH levels are greater than 7.6 milli international units per ml in about 90% of men with non-obstructive azospermia. However, these patients may have normal FSH levels. We should remember that FSH levels correlate with the number of spermatogonia. When spermatogonia are absent or markedly reduced, FSH levels increases. But when the number of spermatogonia is normal, like in case of germ cell maturation arrest, FSH levels are normal. So also important is to look at testosterone levels. Hypogonadism, meaning low testosterone levels, this is laboratory indication of hypogonadism, testosterone levels below 300 nanograms per deciliter is seen in approximately half of the patients with non-obstructive azospermia and generally reflect concurrent Leydig cell insufficiency. Well, non-obstructive azospermia, although it's irreversible and therefore untreatable, it does not necessarily mean sterility. The reason is focal intratesticular sperm production can be found in 30 to 60% of these men. So sperm can be retrieved from the testes and used for ICSI. Testicular sperm are capable of inducing normal fertilization and embryo development and resulting in healthy offspring. So after making the differentiation, the second step is the management algorithm is to prognosticate about sperm retrieval chances of success. And uh, it's important because uncertainty of sperm acquisition make these prognostic factors very desirable. So etiology does not help much with the notable exception of Y chromosome micro deletions that I will discuss briefly later on. But testicular sperm are retrieved in about 50 to 6% of men with a history of cryptorchidism, post-infection, and idiopathic non-obstructive azospermia. And also retrieval rates ranging from 25% to up to 70% are also achieved post-radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and even Kleinfelter syndrome. So histopathology is informative, but as Ricardo discussed late, uh, earlier, 
it requires testicular biopsy, which should not be performed routinely. So a biopsy does not provide definitive proof of whether sperm will be found during sperm retrieval, even in case of certain cell only. The diagnostic biopsy may also remove focal areas of sperm production and affect the chance of success in a future sperm retrieval. So, but if available, if the report is in front of you, the histopathology result is helpful for prognosticating the chance of sperm retrieval success. Patients with certainly cell only have much lower sperm retrieval success than those with maturation arrest or hyperspermatogenesis. What is essential uh, to offer a man with non-obstructive vasospermia sperm is y chromosome microdeletion screening, which is done through a blood test based on PCR. So the AZF region is, the, is located in the long arm of the Y chromosome, and it clusters the genes involved in spermatogenesis regulation. Approximately 10% of men with non-obstructive vasospermia have microdeletions in this region. And in this case, uh, one or more genes that are essential for sperm production are lost. That will explain azospermia. So the test has diagnostic value but it also helps prognosticate sperm retrieval success. For instance, deletions involving subregions AZF-A and or AZF-B, they can come alone or together, are virtually incompatible with any residual spermatogenesis. This patient should be counseled against undergoing sperm retrieval. However, if the patient has only AZF-C deletions, they may have residual spermatogenesis with reported sperm retrieval success of up to 50%. So for these men with AZFC deletions, the probability of fatherhood by ICSI does not seem to be affected by the presence of microdeletions. However, what is important for the clinician is to know that the male offspring of fathers with AZFC microdeletions in which we do ICSI with testicular sperm will inherit the Y chromosome microdeletion and as a, as a result, the patient uh, will be infertile. So genetic counseling is therefore very important before sperm retrieval and PGT may be offered for sex selection to couples undergoing ICSI with the stipular sperm retrieved from patients with AZFC microdeletion if the couple wants to avoid the transmission of this form of infertility to the offspring. Our approach here at Androfer is to offer genetic testing, uh, include for men with non-obstructive azospermia, including karyotype and Y chromosome microdeletion screening. So men with Kleinfelter syndrome karyotype or AZFC microdeletion, they are eligible for sperm retrieval, but some patients opt uh, to pursue other options after knowing their genetic condition, like some patients go for adoption or even use of uh, donor sperm. So the third step is in our algorithms, interventions that we can consider. Uh, and then in this case, it's important to discuss um, medical therapy before sperm retrieval. Why? Because many patients with non-obstructive azospermia have hypogonadism, I mean, low testosterone levels because of the small testicles. So the drugs that have been explored are the selective estrogen receptor modulators, aromatase inhibitors, HCG and FSH. They are used off-label to manipulate male reproductive hormones and optimize intratesticular uh, testosterone production. In the literature, what we see are case series and small cohort studies that suggest that these treatments may increase sperm retrieval rates and in some cases, treatment was associated with return of minimal number of sperm to the ejaculate as a case that we published together with Peter. This is the paper by Larson in which we were uh, successful of having ejaculated sperm in a non-obstructive azospermic patients after gonadotropin uh, treatment. Unfortunately, we don't have randomized controlled trials, making it difficult to make clear recommendations on this matter. What we do, our approach at Androfer is to use HCG alone or in combination with recombinant FSH of label to optimize intratesticular testosterone production and also FSH action. So remember that adequate levels of intratesticular testosterone are critical for spermiogenesis, spermatogonia proliferation, and also upregulation of androgen receptors. So when we give HCG, actually we boost testosterone production. 
And we also reset the elevated baseline FSH levels to normal levels. This FSH reset may lead to increased expression of FSH receptors and has been shown in some studies to improve circular cell function. We follow these patients with a monthly hormonal assessment. We add an aromatase inhibitor in the course of treatment when the testosterone to estradiol ratio turns less than 10. And we also add recombinant FSH when the FSH levels drop to below 1.5 international units per liter during the course of treatment. We monitor the treatment effect by assessing the levels, as I said before, uh, testosterone, estradiol, and also 17 hydroxyprogesterone, which is a marker of intertesticular uh, testosterone production. We need more data in this area, but I feel that hormonal stimulation before the sperm retrieval in men with non-obstruct azospermia may be worth considering in selected cases. Besides hormonal therapy, it has been suggested that varicoselectomy should also be considered in men with non-obstructive azospermia and palpable varicocele. This is a systematic review we did, uh, compiling the data of about 500 patients with non-obstructive azospermia and varicocele. 44% of these patients had some sperm they ejaculate after varicoselectomy. And patients more likely to show improvement were those with hyperspermatogenesis or maturation arrest. I mean, during the varicoselectomy, we usually do a biopsy for these patients. Uh, our meta analysis that I showed before, mentioned that I mentioned before, indicated that varicoselectomy was associated with increased sperm retrieval rates in non obstructive azospermic patients. And live birth seems also to be better when X is carried out with sperm retrieved. Uh, from these patients after varicoselectomy. But the published data are still very limited, and it's still debatable whether varicocele is coincidental or contributory to spermatogenesis disruption in these patients. But what we do know is that spermatogonia, spermatocytes, and nerve spermatids are highly vulnerable to heat stress caused by varicocele, and that varicocele repair may improve spermatogenesis and, and androgen production. So our approach, as uh, Ricardo discussed before, is to discuss with our patients the risk and benefits of varicocele repair in this scenario. We consider the couple together, including the ovarian reserve, age of the partner, and the time needed for a future sperm retrieval attempt. And in selected case, we fix the varicocele using a testicular and lymphatic sparing microsurgical technique. We also use an intraoperative Doppler to help identify and spur the testicular arteries. So then we move to the step four, which re sperm retrieval methods available for these patients. We have um, testicular sperm aspiration, percutaneous aspiration, conventional testicular sperm extraction, and microsurgical testicular sperm extraction, known as microtessy. So the probability of finding sperm varies according to the technique and are higher with open methods than percutaneous methods. This is a, a paper uh, we uh, published in Human Reproduction Update uh, in which we compile the data of controlled studies comparing micro TESI versus conventional TESI. In this paper, when we look at only studies directly comparing both techniques, the relative risk of finding sperm was overall 1.3 times higher with micro TESI. And here you can see that the number of patients needed to treat by micro TESI versus conventional TESI to obtain one additional positive sperm retrieval was about eight. Uh, also important is to look at the worst case scenario, which is certainly cell histopathology. These patients, when uh, we look at the, again, controlled studies, the relative risk of finding sperm is 2.7 times higher with the micro TESI, with a number needed to treat of only five to obtain one additional successful sperm retrieval. This is why in our, uh, in our program, micro TESI is the preferable sperm retrieval method for this man. I will show up a video later, and then I will don't sp spend a lot of time here, but uh, we will discuss this later on. Lastly, I just want to briefly mention the clinical management of men with non-obstructive azospermia should not include laboratory handling of sperm harvested from the seminiferous tubules. There are many steps to consider, uh, but 
uh, the extraction of less tissue by micro tests is a good start because processing of large specimens may be incredibly labor intensive. Uh, there are specific tissue processing techniques, motility stimulants, cryopreservation methods more suitable for these specimens. Um, and I will show this in more detail uh, later on in the movie that I will present to you. We also pay attention to the IVF laboratory environment. Our labs are equipped with a centralized positive pressure air filtration system for both particles and volatile organic compounds, VOC. So not only the IVF labs, but also the operating theater and the embryo transfer areas in our facility are clean ones. We are fortunate to have two IVF labs in the same facility. This setup allows the embryologists to dedicate enough time for the non-obstructive azospermic case, while the routine IVF ICSI workload is taken care in a separate IVF lab. <clears throat> We usually perform microtests as a separate procedure, freezing sperm for future use. In our hands, ICSI with fresh and frozen thawed testicular sperm have been compatible. Our current method for freezing testicular sperm is called cell slipper method, which consists of an outer vial, an inner tray, and a screw cap. Motor sperm then are ejected into the droplet of the tray with the aid of the microinjection pipette. I will show it later to you in the movie. And then we find these uh, procedures doing before the oocyte pickup advantageous from a quality management perspective, because it allows ICSI to be carried out without using, obviously using frozen thought sticker sperm, without it having to program micro tests concomitantly to the oocyte pickup. Another important point is that, uh, and then it goes for the reproductive endocrinologists, gynecologists listening to us today, we did research demonstrating that the probability of having genetically normal blastocysts after X is adversely affected by using testicular sperm from men with non-obstructive azospermia. So what we do before treatment planning um, is trying to improve the chances of biological parenthood for these couples. And for that, we developed a predictive model to estimate the number of oocytes needed to obtain at least one nucleoid blastocyst for transferring couples undergoing IVF. This is called ART calculator, ART calculator, if you like. So the model provides individualized probabilities of blastocyst employed per metaphase to oocytes collected. And then using mathematical equations, we developed a calculator, online calculator, to estimate this minimum number of metaphase to oocytes needed to obtain at least one euploid blastocyst with the 95% confidence intervals. So the art calculator was subsequently validated by a multi-center multinational study. It's, we find it a useful tool that we routinely use in our clinic to estimate the number of oocytes needed to optimize success in couples in whom the male partner has non-obstructive azospermia, but also in the overall IVF population we treat. Here, very briefly, you can see how the calculator works. All you need to do is input the age of the female partner and also the sperm source. As a user, you can define the accuracy you want to have in the estimations. Then you adjust for the type of azospermia and then the calculator provides the minimum number of oocytes required to have at least one nucleoid blastocyst with the 95% confidence interval. As we know well, a nucleoid blastocyst has about 50 to 60% chances of implanting the uterus across all maternal age groups. So the art calculator may help IVF consultants to plan the ovarian stimulation accordingly and the overall X treatment with the mindset of obtaining the optimal number of oocytes to maximize treatment success. I'm also, my last point uh, relates to the health of children born af after ICSI using testicular sperm from men with non-obstructive azospermia. So this is a, uh, a big review article we did uh, with Peter. Uh, we published in Nature Review Urology in 2018, and we found that the risks of congenital disabilities, developmental problems, and other health issues such as childhood cancer have been suggested to be higher in babies conceived by ART when compared to children conceived naturally. With regards to X in particular, newborn parameters 
uh, in men with non-obstructive azospermia are overall similar than that obtained for obstructive azospermia and also ejaculated sperm. However, we need to consider that we have few data published to analyze. We certainly need more studies in this area, particularly long-term follow-up data on physical, neurological, and developmental outcomes for the children conceived. For men with no sperm at all, recovered by any form of sperm retrieval technique, at present, there is little hope. The success of ICSI using spermatid has been dismal, and stem cell therapy is a dream yet to come true. So to conclude, my summary, some take-home messages. Non-obstructive azospermia represents the most challenging male infertility clinical condition to manage. However, remember that 50% of these men have intratesticular sperm production and the sperm can be retrieved from the seminiferous tubules and use it for ICSI and result in viable offspring. We use the five-step algorithm I have shown you to treat our patients, but important is the coordinated multidisciplinary effort involving all of us reproductive urologists, andrologists, geneticists, reproductive endocrinologists, embryologists, and managers, essential to increase the chance of biological parenthood for this vulnerable patient population. For those patients with complete espermatogenesis, no sperm at all, stem cell research aiming at increase, uh, producing, generating the artificial gametes is underway, but has not become a reality yet. So with that, I conclude this uh, presentation. Thank you very much for your patience. And then we can move now for the multiple choice questions related to lesson number, number seven. So if you go to the pool, you see lesson seven. And here we have this, the, first, the first question, which is, the lowest chance of sperm retrieval with microtessy exists for men with AZFC microdeletions, lowest. Kleinefelter syndrome, prior failed conventional um, uh, TESI procedures, or AZFA microdeletion. What is the lowest chance? So I can see that uh, more people are actually responding. AZFA microdeletion, which is correct, according to the published data, it's virtually impossible to retrieve sperm in a patient with AZFA microdeletion. The reason is an essential genes, uh, two genes actually in the AZFA uh, region, subregion, are so important for spermatogenesis. And when those genes are missing, it's not possible to have any sperm retreat. AZFC, we can retrieve some sperm. And also Kleinefelter syndrome, we can also retrieve sperm. So these patients are eligible for sperm retrieval. And the chances are much higher com as compared with AZFA. So the second question is now, uh, you can, let's read it together. A 32-year-old man with infertility is azospermic. His wife evaluation is normal. He has a large left varicocele, a small left testis, 10 uh, cc, and a 16 cc right testis. His FSH levels are elevated, 16. His testosterone levels are below uh, the lower limit, 290. And genetic testing shows no Y chromosome microdeletions. So this patient has uh, and also normal cardiotype. So next step for you would be to repair the varicocele, to go straight uh, directly to the testicular sperm retrieval, epididymal sperm retrieval, consider donor sperm insemination or adoption, or order transrectal ultrasonography with exploration of the seminal vesicles. So most people responded that they will consider varicocele repair, which 
I mean, it's according to our thinking here at Androfer, but it's also correct if you decide to go directly to testicular sperm retrieval because the guidelines are not providing, let's say, clear recommendations concerning vertical seal repair in men with non-obstructive vasospermia. The recent ASRM, AUA, American Urological Association guideline, said that uh, vertical seal repair in uh, non-obstructive vasospermia is not recommended, but we have evidence, on the other hand, showing that repairing a large vertical seal could help these patients to have increased success, although the data is limited. So, I mean, you could either consider vertical seal repair or testicular sperm retrieval, but never epididymal sperm retrieval because patients with non-obstructive azospermia do not have epididymis as a reservoir for having sperm. And the last now, last question before we move to the Q&A is, um, Okay, now the case is a 30-year-old man presenting for infertility evaluation. He's azospermic, his serum FSH levels is elevated, and he has reduced testicular volume bilaterally. So he has a history of previous testicular biopsy, and the biopsy shows certainly cell only. Which of the following statements is correct? First, he does not have areas of normal spermatogenesis. The patient is completely sterile. B, he may have areas of normal spermatogenesis and is a candidate for microdissection to stapler sperm extraction. He may have an obstruction and is a candidate for surgical reconstruction. He has non-obstruct azospermia, but may be a candidate for surgical reconstruction or he has normal spermatogenesis in other areas of the testes. So during my reading, most of you responded correctly. Even a patient with sertoli cell only may have some areas of sperm production, so the patient is a candidate for microdissection of testicular sperm extraction. Patients like that, they are not candidates for surgical reconstruction. There's nothing we can do about that. And uh, the for certainly cell only patients, according to the study I mentioned to you before, uh, it's possible to find sperm in about 20% of cases. So the chance of success in these patients are 20%. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for uh, joining me uh, in this uh, summaries and uh, handling over to Lorela and Peter to discuss the questions that might have come. Thank you very much, Sandro. I can ask, uh, there are, the same question has actually appeared several times. So this is a NOAA patient with a normal testosterone, but a, an, a high FSH. And the question is, would you recommend medical treatment prior to TZ or would you go to directly ahead? So a NOAA patient with normal testosterone, high FSH. Mm. If the testosterone is completely normal, I mean, we need to check what is normal. I mean, if it's in the lower limits, I might consider giving this patient to boost intratestacular testosterone to the optimal levels. The optimal levels to me, Peter, is around 500 nanograms per deciliter, up to 800. We should not exceed the ceiling level. So I would consider uh, giving this patient HCG, uh, but again, we don't have randomized controlled trials and uh, we don't have clear recommendations by the society's guidelines on medical treatment before sperm retrieval. So if any doctor wants to discuss that with his patients, it has to be uh, uh, clarified that there are expenses uh, incurred in the medical treatment with gonadotropin therapy. There are no guarantees at all that we could actually find a sperm after giving the medication. So the patients have to be counseled accordingly. We always consider the option of medical treatment to our patients, and we try to select the best patients to receive medical treatment. To me, uh, our patients with low testosterone levels, hypogonadism, and also patients with maturation arrest. I mean, if I have a patient in which the 
previous histopathology or previous sperm retrieval shows, let's say, a predominant pattern of maturation arrest. I mean, normal FSH levels, normal testicular size. I like to start treatment, not with HCG, but in that case, the FSH. So, I mean, there's a role for medical treatment if we, but we need more data. On this. So, so uh, as you told, told us before, so once you start a treatment with HCG, then obviously you will need to, probably in the majority of patients, you will need after two months or so to add some FSH. Once uh, FSH goes below 1.5, or what is your comment? Or would you, in some patients, not need to add any, any FSH? Well, I think the, the issue of when we give uh, HCG, Peter, what we see is increasing in testosterone levels. So let's say that I have this uh, typical patient with testosterone levels of 250, it's below normal. FSH levels are very high, 18. So you start with HCG. So what happens is that one month later, you check the blood test and you see that the testosterone levels are now 400 nanograms per deciliter and FSH levels are coming down. In uh, about one third, 30% of patients, FSH levels will really come down. You will reset these FSH levels to, let's say, normal or in some case below 1.5. Well, if you get below 1.5, obviously it's suboptimal to kind of sustain, maintain spermatogenesis. So then you have two options. You either titrate the HCG dose, decreasing the dose, but Keep in mind that if decrease too much, the testosterone levels, you lose the beneficial effect that you got with the testosterone uh, increase. Or you can consider giving aromatase inhibitor because these patients, perhaps they have low testosterone to stradiol ratio. When you give aromatase inhibitors, you kind of release a little bit of the pituitary and you get elevated, some increase in FSH LH, or you add FSH exogenous FSH. So, I mean, the doctor has to decide. Our approach here is actually try to make the treatment cost-effective. So, we give HCG, and then if FSH levels goes very down and the patient has aromatase hyperactivity signs, we give aromatase inhibitor. If it's not working well, and then we go for FSH. So, we may have a prescription, as we did in the patient we treated together, that we get HCG and FSH and aromatase inhibitor eventually to get the most optimal, uh, let's say, uh, endocrine profile for these patients to potentially increase his chances of sperm retrieval. So now we, we learned earlier today that a lot of the, the viewers today are reproductive and chronologists. So I'd like to ask you, do, we, do FSH receptor polymorphisms exist in the male also? Yes, uh, FSH receptors polymorphism exists in the male. They has been shown to, uh, in, by some studies, to modulate the response. The FSH, for instance, when we give FSH therapy using urinary or recombinant FSH, it looks like patients with the polymorphisms are those who benefit more. There is a study, uh, particular looking at sperm DNA fragmentation, and this uh, trial it was by the group of Manuela Simoni from Italy. They showed that the patients who got certain polymorphisms affecting the FSH receptors were those most likely to benefit from treatment. So it looks like the situation is also there for the male. And then another Peter, question. Peter, yeah, sorry. Peter, Peter, we're running out of time. Okay. And uh, uh, we have a video that uh, Sandra wanted to show about the micro teaser. Uh, should we see it? Yes, let's go for it. Androford presents Microdissection Testicular Sperm Extraction. Microdissection Testicular Sperm Extraction or microtese is a surgical method of sperm acquisition for men with non-obstructive azospermia seeking fertility. In this movie, we present the surgery as performed at Androfert, describing its critical steps.
the patient is brought shaved to the operating room where he is placed in the supine position, prepped and draped accordingly. In our settings, microtese is performed on an outpatient basis under intravenous combined with local anesthesia. The procedure requires an operating microscope, microsurgical expertise, and a set of microsurgical instruments. A transversal scroto incision is fashioned and the hemiscrotum is entered. The tunica vaginalis is opened and the testis is delivered. A 10 milliliter solution of 2% lidocaine is injected around the spermatic cord. Men with non-obstructive azospermia usually have small testes, as seen in this movie. Identification of testicular vessels under the tunica abulgenia is made before the placement of an incision into the testis. A line is drawn in a relatively avascular area to guide the incision. In this particular case, the patient had a small scar from a previous sperm retrieval attempt that was cauterized. An equatorial nonlinear incision is fashioned in the tunica abulgenia using a 15 degree knife under operating microscopy at 6 to 8 times magnification. The abulgenia borders at the incision site are clamped and the testicular parenchyma widely exposed. Microdissection is carried out through all areas of the superior and inferior poles of the testis. Magnification of 16 to 25 times is used when searching for the largest seminiferous tubules. Optical magnification and microsurgery allow the preservation of intratesticular blood supply and the identification of the seminiferous tubules more likely to have sperm production. These enlarged seminiferous tubules are removed with microforceps and placed in a petri dish containing sperm culture medium. The specimens are weighed individually.
and then sent to the IVF laboratory for examination. In the IVF lab, the specimens will be processed to facilitate the sperm search. First, under a stereo microscope, the tubules are loosened. and their diameter recorded. In general, the larger the tubule diameter, the greater the chance of finding active spermatogenesis. Two embryologists work simultaneously, squeezing the tubules to speed up the process. The specimens are examined under the inverted microscope in search of sperm. The surgeon is informed promptly if any sperm are found. Additional specimens can be taken to secure enough sperm for ICSI and cryopreservation. We usually take one or more specimens for histopathology analysis. The abulgenia is closed with a 5-0 non-absorbable running suture. Then, the tunica vaginalis is closed with an absorbable suture. The testicle is placed back to the hemiscrotum. Subsequently, the dartos and skin layers are closed with absorbable sutures. Meanwhile, in the IVF lab, the specimen is processed for ICSI.
Pentoxifiline, a sperm motility stimulant, is added to the sperm suspension microdroplets. It makes it easier to identify viable sperm for ICSI or cryopreservation. In our settings, microtese is usually performed as a separate procedure and the retrieved sperm are cryopreserved for future use. Our method of choice for freezing testicular sperm is the cell sleeper method. The cell sleeper consists of an outer vial, an inner tray, and a screw cap. The inner tray is removed from the vial, placed in the lid of a culture dish. Then, a two microliter droplet of cryopreservation solution is pipetted into the tray in a central position. Modal sperm are ejected into the droplet on the tray with the aid of a microinjection pipette. After that, the tray is placed into the vial, and the vial is closed with the screw cap. The vial is placed in the horizontal position 4 to 5 centimeters above the liquid nitrogen surface. After two minutes, the vial is submerged in liquid nitrogen. Lastly, the vial is secured into a cryopreservation cane for storage. This procedure is advantageous from a quality management perspective as it allows intracytoplasmic sperm injection to be carried out using frozen thawed testicular sperm without having to program microtese concomitantly to the oocyte pickup. Thank you, Sandra. Very interesting video. Uh, we are still receiving upcoming questions from all over, from Algeria, Australia, China, Germany, Jordan, uh, Indonesia. But we have to move forward, Peter. We have a case study that you have to introduce. Yeah, we have a very interesting case study, and this is coming out of India. This is Dr. Pramod Krishnappa. So Dr. Pramod works at the NU Fertility in Ambangalore. He's a committee member in the Urological Society of uh, India, the USI Male Infertility Guidelines, and is also the Andrologist of Speciality Appointment member of USI. So Dr. Pramod, please go ahead with your interesting case. Yeah, thank you. I thank all the organizers for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to present at this international platform. Okay, I, I will be discussing about uh, a case uh, about uh, congenital bilateral absence of vas deferens, which is commonly called as a CBAVD, and which can commonly be missed as well. Okay, here is a 33-year-old husband and a 29-year-old wife. Uh, both are well-educated and they're married since two years and without any uh, sexual dysfunction. So they were referred to me by 
our reproductive medicine consultant for the male factor evaluation. And uh, they also came with a semen analysis report uh, showing uh, azoospermia in a volume of uh, 0.5 ml with a normal pH and a normal fructose. Of course, the semen analysis was repo uh, repeated on, 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 on three different occasions. And his uh, hormone workup was also normal. So, and uh, with this history, uh, we, uh, he, uh, the, the, the husband was seen by one of our urology residents. And uh, we have uh, three urology residents every year joining us. And, uh, uh, and he had written saying uh, it has a, a normal examination. And uh, when I examined the patient, because I make it a point to examine all patients of isospermia myself, even though uh, my resident has examined. And, uh, and when I examined, the vast difference was absent. And the testicular size was normal. And the epididymis was turgid, meaning full. So this is a very common uh, scenario where uh, res the residents or, or somebody who is new into this male factor evaluation, they might miss uh, examining this vast difference. And, uh, uh, and, and of course, it takes a different turn if this simple finding is missed at the uh, very uh, first examination itself. And with this uh, examination, so uh, a, diagnosis, a clinical diagnosis of congenital bilateral absence of vas difference was made. And uh, subsequently, we got the uh, genetic testing done, which is the CFTR gene mutation of the husband. As you see here, uh, they, the, genetic, the medical genetics lab identified a uh, uh, heterozygous missense variant. And this variant was of uncertain significance. And as we all know that in SCB AVD case, the female also needs to be evaluated for the CFTR gene mutation. And uh, the wife, CF, wife's genetic mutation testing was normal. So, and uh, subsequently we counseled them, although there is uh, uh, risk, whatever the genetic, uh, uh, the test comes out, but still there is always a risk of the offspring having this CBAVD or a cystic fibrosis. With that counseling, we uh, went ahead with the percutaneous epididymal sperm aspiration and coupled with the ICSI and uh, they conceived and they have a two uh, lovely kids now. Few points about the CBAVD. This is the cause for infertility in 1% of the infertile men, and also 6% of men with obstructive azoospermia may have CBAVD as the cause. And any CFTR alteration can lead to CBAVD. However, only those with homozygous mutations and not heterozygous mutations, they exhibit a cystic fibrosis disease. And the main uh, the point here in genetic testing is that there are around 2,000 CFTR gene mutations uh, that are identified, but uh, it, is it is not practical to test all these 2,000 uh, mutations. And uh, the, the, even the American College of Obstetrics Gynecology and the Medical Genetics, they say they recommend that at least 30 to 50 mutations needs to be identified. And uh, so with this testing, if the female partner is a carrier of the mutation, then there is a 50% risk of child having the cystic fibrosis or the CBAVD. So in such a case, we need to explain the couple saying that whether they really would like to proceed uh, with, the, with, the, with the husband's sperm or they would like to uh, go for the donor's sperm. And the second instance is if the part, female partner is negative for the known mutations, uh, the risk of being a carrier of these unknown mutations is just 0.4%. And the, the, whenever the genetic test is done, like I said, 30 to 50 mutations are tested. And among these, the most common mutation is the Delta F508, and which, is, which constitutes to around 24%. And the next most common is the T5 mutation, which is seen in around 17% of the uh, mutations. And there has been a recent paper 
um, from the US saying that the ICSI outcomes are better in patients who have only CBAVD versus patients who have combined CB, CBAVD and cystic fibrosis. And uh, to, 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 to summarize and to give the take home message from this case is that CBAVD is always a clinical diagnosis. It is not an operative or an investigative diagnosis. Hence, the vast difference should be palpated in all patients presenting with azospermia. In case uh, there is a unilateral absence of vast difference and not bilateral absence, uh, in such cases, we need to do an ultrasound of the abdomen to rule out unilateral renal agenesis. And CFTR gene mutation, the testing is not standard across all labs across the world. The, the most common mutations seen uh, in, in, as, as per the local ethnicity and as per the local mutations that is seen, uh, only such uh, mutations are tested when we send a couple for CFTR gene mutation. By this, I end my case. I'll be happy to receive any questions. Thank you for this opportunity. Peter, thank you, Dr. Pramod. Thank you very much. Peter, now, uh, if uh, we have some questions for Dr. Pramod, we will read them afterwards, but we have to move on because uh, we have um, other case study to present. Well, I'd like I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Pramod for this excellent uh, case series, which is a, a case story, which is of, of importance for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Arnold's mute. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. So, hello everyone. My name is Arnold Ashman. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. And I'd like to thank for the organizer for the opportunity to present the case study. And, uh, so, this is a case refers to a 36 year old man who came for evaluation with a history of seven year primary infertility and azospermia. His current wife is 27 year old and apparently normal according to an evaluation done by a gynecologist with infertility expertise. She is his second partner and his previous marriage. Uh, he also tried to have a baby without success. However, the patient said that the ex-wife had a life born after the divorce. In uh, sexual history, the patient complained of the, uh, decreased libido and mild erectile dysfunction, which result in an irregular intercourse routine. His childhood and development history is unremarkable. And also there is no history of previous or current gonadotoxin exposure or medication use. The only thing important is the history of right side hernia repair a few years ago without apparent complications. However, the patient referred that the size of the right test is decreased after the operation. On his physical examination, he is overweight, has normal hair distribution, and no gynecomastia. His right testicle is atrophic, only 3 cc involved while his left testicle is normal in size, 18 cc, with normal consistency. The epididymis on the side is also apparently normal. And uh, both deferens are capable and no varicose cell was detected on physical examination. Uh, there is a right inguinal scar from his previous inguinal uh, hernia surgery. Okay, here you can see his hormone profile, which is essentially normal except his total testosterone levels, which is on the lower limits. The semen analysis show normal volume, ejaculate, and pH, with a dospermia confirmed after the examination uh, of centrifuged specimen. 
So at this point, I would like to discuss if it's possible to establish the type of azospermia uh, between obstructive and all, or, or non-obstructive azospermia, and if we need additional tests. Well, I can jump in quickly, just uh, uh, highlighting that most probably at one side, you had a problem related to perhaps some iatrogenic testicular injury during the hernia repair because the testicle is now atrophic, but the other testicle looks pretty normal. And looking at the uh, only at one side, one testicle normal, I would, I'm not sure if the patient has obstructive or non-obstructive exospermia. I think it's important to have some more testing, at least the genetic testing, to my opinion. Yeah, so, uh, okay. Uh, the challenge here is to distinguish uh, between uh, obstructive and non-obstructive exospermia. So I've performed further investigation with genetic testings, both uh, karyotype and Y chromosome microrelation. And, uh, uh, both of them were normal. So I decided to do a percutaneous test biopsy to gather more information. Uh, and then procedure was done at the outpatient basis at the fertility clinic. So in case of fighting viable sperm, the plan was to offer cryopreservation. However, the fresh examination showed abundant numbers of germ cells, uh, but no ma ma mature sperm the histopathology confirmed the, the presence of maturation arrest at the secondary spermatocyte stage, confirming, uh, the confirming that the patient had no obstructive azospermia as a diagnosis. So with this diagnosis, uh, the patient asked about first his chances of having his own biological child, or if it would be better to consider use of sperm bank or adoption, Second, if any medication could be used to improve sperm production, and if any other technique could be used to try to find sperm for assisted conception. I can comment on that. Um, uh, can you go back a little? Yeah. So the chances of biological parenthood, uh, they exist, and uh, you don't need to go straight uh, forward to sperm banking or adoption, unless you had a um, my Y microdeletion on locus A or B. Uh, medical treatment has a role in here, especially because this is a good scenario where you have maturation arrest, especially if it's a late uh, maturation arrest, spermatocyte maturation arrest. Uh, open sperm retrieval, definitely yes. I think the 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 preparation here is to plan a micro uh, on the way forward. So that, that would be my take on this. So can I just jump in here? So, uh, Ricardo, so you would go directly to microtasia without any medical, uh, let's say, maybe you could make, maybe he could have ejaculate sperms if you oh, just- Oh, no, 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 oh, Peter, no. What I said is that uh, considering open, uh, if you consider sperm retrieval, mm. my take would go to microtasia. But yeah, yes, okay. definitely, this is a good scenario to try medical treatment before yeah. anything else, yes. Fine, thank you. Sorry if I didn't make myself clear, thank you. So I have a follow-up about this case uh, to share with you because we performed a micro section, testicular sperm extraction. Uh, but before our operation, we use an off-label hormone modulation to boost testosterone levels. So uh, as routine for us, we started with HCG, about 3,500 international units twice a week. And two months later, his total testosterone levels improved and the LH levels dropped as expected when, when HCG is given, but FSH levels also dropped to levels, but below 1.5 international units per ml, which are insufficient for sperm production. Also, the estradiol levels increased slightly, which uh, was expected, and we see it often after HCG therapy. It happens when testosterone levels increase, because part of testosterone is converted to estradiol by the aromatase enzyme. If we divide the testosterone levels here, 476 by the estradiol levels, 55, the ratio will be 8.6. And levels before, be, uh, below 
then are considered abnormal in indicating aromatized hyperactivity. For this reason, we introduced an astrozole, an aromat uh, uh, aromatase in a hybrid, one milligram per day. And we also introduced a uh, recombinant FSH 150 international units twice a week because the FSH levels were very low as said. So at the time of microtesi, uh, 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 the hormone profile was adequate with total testosterone level above 500 nanograms per deciliter and testosterone to estradiol ratio was at both time. Uh, during the microtesi performed only on the left desk, which was the good one, uh, we were able to retrieve viable sperm. The retrieved uh, sperm were cryopreserved, and we took a specimen for histopathology examination, which revealed predominant maturation arrest with areas of hyperspermatogenesis. And finally, this is the result of the IVF cycle done subsequently. We routinely estimate the number of all sites needed to have at least one aeoploid blastocyst uh, using the ART calculator. And in this case, consider it first, the age of the wife, which was uh, 27 year old, and the use of the testicular sperm from a, a patient with no obstructed azospermia. The calculator estimated that about five metaphase to all sites would be needed uh, to have at least one aeoploid blastocyst for a transfer. At all site pickup, seven metaphase to all site were retrieved, five of which fertilized and three developed until the blastocyst uh, stage. A single embryo transfer was performed and a subsequently on a subsequently cycle, uh, which uh, resulted in a term delivery of a baby boy at term. So thank you so much for the opportunity. So, uh... Arnold, can I just ask you a question? Because I was thinking, now obviously it's not all of us who will have the possibility to do micro TC. So do you think this person would have been able to produce some ejaculate sperm if we had waited a little bit longer? Maybe we cannot be sure about that, but we have in the literature uh, some research, uh, some articles that uh, published with uh, Dr. Sanders Davis, that uh, improving his uh, hormone profiles may have sperms in the ejaculate. Um, like Larsen had published with Dr. Davis a, a, a few months or years ago, mm -hmm. I don't remember so, mm -hmm. but yeah. they improved their, their hormone profiles and started to have uh, sperm in the ejaculate, like a cryptozoospermia and then cryopreserved, which could be avoided a, 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 um, a micro TV. Yeah. So, uh, fine. Now, I have another question, which is quite clinical, because, okay, now this uh, couple uh, had a, a child, which is excellent. So, what are we going to do as reproductive endocrinologists with this guy? We know that we stopped treatment, and maybe, hopefully, there was sperm there for cryopreservation. But what are we going to do about his, let's say, general health issue with low testosterone for, in future? What are we going to do for him? Once their sperms are quite preserved, then his, uh, he has a, a bank of his own sperms. Uh, now he can uh, stop this kind of med medications, which is really expensive. We know about that. And we can continue with uh, more cheap uh, medicines if we, he needed. We know that after micro the, the the damage to the Tesco is not so, so huge as other kinds of uh, procedures like TZ maybe that we can take out parts of the parenchyma which produce testosterone and micro -TZ, we know like there are uh, in the literature some articles that prove uh, after two years after micro TZ 98% uh, of cases that continue to have close to the, the, the first uh, testosterone levels after the, 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 the mm. procedure so the yeah, micro -TZ is not so harmful no. And if the testosterone is below and he has uh, he bank sperms, then he can continue to yeah test but, therapy. Uh, but Arnold, you didn't answer my question because he will tell you, Arnold, you told me the other day my testosterone is low and my libido is very poor. I've got a wonderful young life, uh, young wife. So please help me. My testosterone is low. 
And I know that there will be, could be serious consequences for my long-term health with low testosterone being a male. So Arnold, can you do something for me? Yes, to, 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 um, to help to, to treat his libido and to increase his testosterone levels. Uh, we must do a testosterone therapy, exogenous therapy after this, this, this because testosterone therapy, exogenous testosterone therapy uh, is damageful for his fertility. So first his fertility treatment, then we can treat with exogenous uh, testosterone therapy uh, continues afterwards. Yes, I, I totally agree with you. I just bring this forward because this is what we as reproductive endocrinologists always forget. Our aim is the child. And then we leave these guys hanging around with no, and no one has actually has an interest in these guys and someone needs to take care of them. Sandro, what do you, can you comment on it also? So Peter, thank you very much for bringing these intriguing questions to, to the field. What I do, well, first of all, there are some message, messages uh, that first, we need to improve the cryopreservation of the cyclic sperm. So if we can do, I mean, if we can improve the chance of finding sperm, first of all, by any sort of intervention, I think this is important because when I go for sperm retrieval, not always, first of all, I will find sperm. And if I find, sometimes the numbers are small. Uh, so any, uh, any intervention to improve the chances of having more sperm, that's perfect. If the patient can afford longer medication, as you said, this is a case of maturation arrest. I would insist on that because we can start having ejaculated sperm in some in few cases, obviously, but uh, we, we can achieve that and then we can freeze using, let's say, uh, ejaculated specimens. So first point is having good cryopreservation program. Second is, uh, I mean, for this patient, obviously, the most important thing is having is have the baby at home. So now the patient is happy and they got two blastocysts, if I remember right, um, in, in, in the freeze in the freezer, and now, well, but the baby is not the second child they might want to have. So why would discuss with the patient with the complaints about libido, et cetera, et cetera, if he prefers to stay on HCG alone, I mean, not giving him FSH, which is more expensive, but giving HCG once a week, I have several patients taking HCG because the patients can say, well, I prefer to be on the safe side. And if I started taking testosterone replacement therapy now, I'm still young and I might want to have a bigger family. And considering that, let's say those blastocysts do not implant, and now I will be perhaps five years on a testosterone replacement therapy. And then you need to stop and start everything again. Well, and you know, testosterone therapy might will shut down completely the central system, I will discuss with these patients. Well, we have HCG, which is not so expensive if you take it, if you take it, I mean, um, once a week. And there's also selective estrogen receptors modulator that you might also consider. So the options obviously are the testosterone therapy, but I think the discussion about uh, treatment to keep his um, sexual life good and overall health very good using some medication that will not shut down completely in the fertility is is advisable you are muted Pete. i just wanted to ask you thank you very much for this clear answer i just wanted to ask you are there any reports about uh, negative effects from long-term HCG treatment. Now we're talking about, let's say, once a week for 10 years ahead. Mm. I don't have this data. I have patients uh, treating for over five years now. And I monitor with, a, um, I mean, the blood test, the liver enzymes, uh, the, um, I mean, the overall uh, monitoring uh, using, um, clinical examination, but I don't feel these patients are actually complaining of problems with long-term HCG use. We have children, obviously we have, for instance, if we go back 
to hypohypo Kalman syndrome children in which they start having HCG treatment very early. We have patients uh, for a long uh, time, long term, getting HCG, Peter, and it doesn't look like these patients perform, let's say, with some adverse effect. I think it, for my point of view, I think it's a safe therapy to offer. Thank you. What I perhaps I would like to uh, discuss that you might comment, Peter, is from the from the um, gynecological point of view, the ovarian stimulation. We have also Fabiana with us. Uh, Fabiana is from our faculty. Fabiana is uh, handling many of these cases with us. And uh, there are several questions that doctors come up like, I mean, what kind of protocol shall we offer these patients? Shall we do fresh transfer or frozen embryo transfer? Also, Rita is with us from the lab. Um, also, many questions related to the frozen sperm. Uh, I mean, doctors many times are confused on how to optimally handle these patients. Don't you agree? Yes, definitely. And I agree with your policy also. Why start stimulating a lady if you don't know that you're going to retrieve sperm? So this is why we do it exactly the way you do it. We, we retrieve the sperms, we, we cryopreserve them on, on cell sleepers. And then once we have sperms in the freezer, this is when we start the whole stimulation process of the ladies. So may I ask Fabiana to comment? perhaps on the protocol that you prefer for this sort of patients, you use what kind of protocol, how you kind of decide the dose. And uh, I mean, could you give us some? So thank you for inviting me to, to join this, this event. So here we, we are used to, to, to protocol with antagonists. And we, here we use the Primalute, that nortestosterone, to, to program the menstruation of the patient. And using that, we can get a more synchronized growth of the follicles and our standard protocol is that the antagonist programming the menstruation in the, in the previous cycle with Primalut. So this is the, uh, the antagonist protocol. And uh, <clears throat> for these micro cases, <clears throat> usually you, you try to get more eggs. Um, what's the overall take? I mean, for the doctors perhaps, because perhaps the testicular sperm is not fertilizing so well. Do you do PG? Do you discuss with your patients about having embryo biopsy only because of testicular sperm, or only when it's more related to the female age? Perhaps yes, I can, can follow up with that. Also, commenting on his take on that. I take in account more the the age of the the female, and uh, because I we feel that it's more, the, the embryo is more sensitive. So here we prefer to, to counseling the PGT just with, just in case the, the, the female is older. I don't know Perhaps, if you want to comment more. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you very much. I would just want, perhaps that Rita might be able to make a comment because I know that in the lab, you have a lot of experience with this case we are handling every day. And you are doing a lot of stimulation in terms of using pentoxifiline. And do you really see that this uh, based on the, on the experience, the observations that you have had, you feel that these protocols when we are talking about the stickler sperm from men with non-obstructed azospermia, do you feel a benefit of these protocols, perhaps to be used as routine? What kind of, what kind of comment could you make? 
Hi, everybody. Thank you a lot for the invitation. We are using spermotile stimulator as pentoxifilin as a routine in our lab. And yes, we are observing a great difference in fertilization rates. And we observed also a difference in the blastocyst rate, but we have not statistical difference for now between the groups of no, uh, no, uh, no uh, obstructive azospermin men, men submitted to microtis that have a success with the recovery of sperm and submitted to ICSI comparing that that we use the spermy motile stimulator and also all site artificial all site protocols but i believe that in in a short time we will see you will see a statistical difference in my in my opinion we need to to apply these protocols for these patients because if we perform the conventional ICSI, the results will not be the sufficient maybe to have an euploid embryo, an euploid blastocyst. So if we have more fertilized oocytes and more blastocysts, our chance will be, will be to have a health baby we will increase using these protocols. And we are applying these not only for cryopreserved cryo samples, but also for fresh, fresh samples. Thank you very much. Back to you, Peter. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sandro, I think uh, we were supposed to close the, the session now, or what do you feel? I think you have some closing remarks, and I have a few final slides then at the end, I think. I don't know how you want to do it. You, or you want me to do the slides, or you want to do the slides yourself? No, I think you can do it. I just want to say, from my part, I would like to thank everyone. So it was fantastic experience for having you for over three hours now very productive meeting. I mean, a uh, lot of interaction with uh, your people sending questions. I would like to thank each and all of you for being with us today, taking out time out during a Saturday. Uh, so I hope you continue following us in this program. We will have more for you in the coming, in the coming weeks with more live sessions in, the, in Germany and the USA. Thank you all of you from the technical team, from Medea, Chloe. Yeah. Also, thank, thank you, you, Lorela. And also thank the you, faculty. Sandra. It was a pleasure. Thank you faculty, very much. Faculty, all the faculty thank joining you, us today. And you too, Peter. Thank you very much for taking time out on a Saturday. And they are being with us, collaborating with this program. We have been collaborating for so long years now. And it's great pleasure to have you as a collaborator and as the best friend. Thank you very much. So I'd just like to fill in also and said, dear friends, dear colleagues, you have just witnessed something fantastic. I am not aware of a program which has been performed like this before. I really hope that this is just the beginning of a successful, uh, let's say, series of uh, events like this, hopefully physically later on, because this is what we all need. And I have been so lucky now for many years to be a very good friend of Sandro's. I learned everything from him. I still, there's still a lot I need to learn, but it's been very, very interesting being with all of you today. Now, I was asked to show you the final slides, and I hope that uh, I can now uh, move the slides. Uh, well, it seems as if there is a problem with the... Uh, with Here we are. Now, look at this. This is what we really urge you to do. Please fill in the survey at the end of the live session. We need to know whether we should go ahead with this type of meeting. And then this obviously will allow you to receive your certificate and diploma. And remember that we actually applied to the EACCME for the live session. And finally, I think 
which is also very important, that remember <laughs> that this preceptorship is out there in cyberspace. It's available. You can look at it whenever you want to see it. And please have a download. And finally, the final slide is this one. Uh, Sandro says, see you on Saturday, 29th of May at 12 p.m. CET in Hamburg, Germany. So from me, thank you very much. Sandro? So it's back to you, Lorella. I think you can, you can conclude the meeting. Thank you very so, much. Uh, we really want to thank uh, everyone that's connected, uh, the attendees uh, that connected. I want to thank the experts, uh, Peter, Sandro, Arnold, Rita, uh, Ricardo, Fabiana, and all the others. I also want to thank the team uh, from Milan, Andrea, and all his team. I want to thank uh, Chloe from Medea and Simona. And I hope to be with you also on the 29th. Uh, have a happy Sunday and hopefully things will get better for everyone. And we might be a bit more out of the pandemia next time we meet. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.